minus 30 seconds. T minus 20 seconds. Coolest Reptile Podcast in the World, episode 439, Trap Talk Reptile Podcast, all in the tree, Tuesdays with Garrick DeMeyer. What is good, everybody? I'm your boy, MJ. Everyone's having a great week so far. If this is your first time hanging out with us. If you're into keeping green tree pythons, but seriously, overall reptiles, um, and you want to learn more about them, if you're trying to figure out how to breed them, or if you already breed them, you want to learn how to more cool stuff about them, this is the podcast, this is the channel to be subscribed to, so First and foremost, hit that like button. Why don't we get that like up right now? And then if you're all into that stuff I just said, smash that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, select all. You'll be on top of every single podcast I drop here on this channel. I come out with three podcasts a week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursdays. I do not miss. You can also listen to Trap Talk Reptile Podcast on all the major audio platforms such as Buzzsprout, Apple, Spotify, Google Play, all of them, all the big ones. All right, so wherever you listen to this podcast, Thank you so much for all the love and support. Thank you for spending your life with me. I'm having a great time, and we're just getting started. Support US ARC. Very important. Let's just get to that right now. If you're in the reptile game, you should, you should, you should, what the hell is going on? If you are in the reptile ga- game, you should be supporting US ARC. The numbers are very important as far as memberships goes, and it doesn't cost much, all right? So please consider becoming a US ARC member, especially if you've been in this game for a while, all right? I don't want to get into specifics, but God damn, if I have, if I notice some people who do not have a US ARC membership, all right, and I get it, we're in some weird times, but anything helps. So I appreciate anyone out there who supports US ARC. Thank you so much for being on the same team. Thank you to Phil Goss, all the entire US ARC staff and everyone who's supporting US ARC. You guys are awesome. Um, let's get to, to tonight's sponsors. All right, first and foremost, the best in the game on YouTube, GS Reptiles, my boy Gary Shafino, diversity at its finest, but also probably one of the most knowledgeable guys in the game as far as diversity goes. And he provides everything as far as what he gives tips wise on all sorts of shit on his YouTube channel. GS reptiles type that in on YouTube, subscribe, hit that notification bell, be ready. He drops his shows. I believe once one Friday a month, I believe don't worry. I'm working on that, but either way, Gary, thank you so much for all the love and support. Also, if you're looking to tap in with some of these amazing diversity of boreal species, emerald tree boas, carpet pythons, uh, green tree pythons, this is this is a guy you want to tap in with. Trust me. All right. Again, Gary Shavino, GS Reptiles, my big dog right there. Appreciate you so much. I will say behind me in my beautiful Focus Keep habitats are my boreal snakes that are perched on my David Brom design PVC perch over at the reptile perch. All right. If you are getting into the chondro game or the arboreal species game and you are looking for that simplicity setup or just fuck it i mean these perches work just as good as inside of a bioactive if you want to go that route doesn't matter your chondro your emerald tree boa your arboreal species snake should be perched on a reptile perch all right so shout out to david brahms all right if you need these perches stack go to reptileperch.com put an order in and then he's also has those 3d perches that are designed for the tubs like the 16 uh quart tubs and the six quart tubs he has them for all sizes it's amazing so david brahms you're the man appreciate the love and support he also has amazing amazing conjo projects that he has going on as well so that's why it's important to go to his website the reptileperch.com all right last but not least shout out to texas's finest one of texas many finest but my man mark hager over at texas chondros all right if you want to talk about heat that you should be collecting when it comes to building a conjure collection that's my guy right here man First and foremost, if you're not following TX Chondros on Instagram, you're sleeping on the entire Cond- Texas Chondro community. One thing about Mark is he puts the entire Texas Chondro community on the map on his page, and he does a really good job at it. He's been doing it for a while, and I appreciate the positivity, but more importantly, just the love that he gives to the entire Chondro community. One of the best guys in the game for sure. So that's Mark Hager over at Texas Chondros. 
Again, head over to his website as well, texasconjures.com. See what he has. Consider that Texas Chondro production into your Chondro collection. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him back. Amateur hour's over for these two. They're fucking there back is. building Bill Stegall and Marshall Mendez. Back at the trap. Thank God. What's good, fellas? You're What's in. up? Marshall, I've been we've been missing each other. I know, man. I know. I feel like I haven't seen you in forever. Well, I would like to start out the show, MJ, if you don't mind, with a toast to our friend Bruce Carpenter. May, <laughs> may his science live on and his bioactivity, biosecurity continue to thrive. Yes, and may I never Cheers. And may I never threaten anyone in a wheelchair ever again. <laughs> Cheers. Peace. But motherfuckers don't test me, okay? <laughs> hey, what's, hey, what's going on though, man? How you guys been, uh, Marshall? Uh, let's get to you real quick, cause you, you know you got you know I appreciate the nine to five grind, my man. But and I don't even want to call it nine to five, but you got quite of a bit of a trip ahead of you. You getting ready for some work stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, I've got a big work uh, work trip happening next week. So trying to get the snakes ready and you know the rats ready, and it's freaking going to be nine degrees here tonight. So that's no fun. And uh, yeah, just uh, got a lot going on right now. It's very stressful, but nine, but that's nine okay. Degrees, nine degrees in Alabama. Yeah, is that normal? Nine. Fuck no. Okay. No, that's that's very that's very abnormal. It just Bill just had it yesterday, right? Or a yeah, couple days we've been, ago? We've been in the teens for a couple days. Finally, a few degrees higher today and it's moving through. But yeah, you're getting it right now. Yep. And, yep. And you know, and Bill, you're no stranger to this kind of weather, obviously. That's why you're ready for this shit, aren't you? You got your generators ready to rock. I mean, you're ready to go for anything if it, if it were to happen, God bless, right? Y yeah, and uh uh, MJ, I, I've talked to you about it before. I'm so not confident in the Texas power grid here. Um, you know, I learned my lesson back in February 2021. It was brutal. And I said I'd never going to let that happen again. And, you know, so, yeah, I'm ready for it if, if it comes through. And, Marshall, I'm just curious. Will you have shit lined up, you know, while you're gone? I mean, what's what, what do you do in this case during this time of year if you go on a, you know, work I'm trip? Not, and I'm not worried about, like, uh, uh, I'm just more worried about the animals. Like I'm not, you know, knock on wood, like something bad will happen this time. But you now I've got a generator. I'm not worried about the power. I'm really not worried about it. You know, it's just just worried about uh, just being gone for so long, you know. And well, Laura's going to, you know, w wife, son are going to be here. So they'll be able to come down, check on things, you know, mist or spray, you know, whatever. Can they, uh, can they get the generator going if they need to, Marshall? Son. It's auto. It's auto transfer nice. switch. So it'll just turn. It'll just turn on. Yeah. Yeah. Real nice. That's huge. Yeah, man. You know what's crazy, and you know we'll, we'll, we'll kind of get to the, the episode after this, but I'm just, it's crazy how a lot of people like almost spread themselves thin just buying the shit that they can buy, but then when it comes to like something like this happening and they don't have a generator ready or they don't have anything ready to rock, like it's like it's a huge rude awakening sometimes. Oh yeah. And it's like fuck, dude. And this is just goes to anybody who's just now getting into the reptile game and and haven't really experienced anything like this, and it could possibly happen. These are two guys right here, just letting you know, like it's fucking. You got to be ready. You know what I'm saying? So, um, but yeah, all it, yeah. All it takes is one. You know, yeah. all it takes yeah. is one misadventure. And we've preached the importance of husbandry. You know, buying quality husbandry components before. You know, many times, and I think a generator is is just part of that. Well, I've had one ever since I owned owned a house because uh, when I moved into my first house, I already had some snakes and I mean, it's it's paid for itself. I, I don't know how many times over, same. you know, if you. Yeah. And not necessarily in uh, the heating or cooling, but in the incubator and incubator. keeping my keep my incubator running when there's eggs in it. Yep. <laughs> probably the most important thing, probably when that all, any power goes off is that that's the thing that needs that attention the most is whatever you have cooking in the incubator talk about yeah i mean it just depends just depends where you are because i mean here at you know nine degrees is an exception like that's happened that happens like once every couple of years but power goes out from a storm you know a couple times a month sometimes in the summertime so right well, I, I have no one to complain when it comes to weather, so I'm going to keep my mouth shut when it comes to the fucking what you guys are talking about. But yeah, hold on. Who we're bringing on tonight, 
will shit on both and all of us. Will ah, have yes, he will. We got someone in Wisconsin. <laughs> okay. Wisconsin does not play when it comes to weather. That's some real fucking cold. And, and, and I want to know first and foremost, what do we know about tonight's guest? Let's go with Marshall. Marshall, what do you know about the uh, Garrick DeMeyer? Someone who's pretty heavy in a ball pythons, but obviously on the low. Yeah, level. man. Yeah. He's had, uh, uh, I, I remember he got some condros from me back in, uh, it was, it was at, uh, Daytona. I don't know. I can't remember when it was. It was when Condro Coalition was set up, but uh, so it had to be, geez, I don't know. Maybe he'll remember like 04, 05, something like that. Maybe Bill, even earlier than that. Bill, have you ever met Garrick? Or do you, what's your, what's your, uh, your, your, as far as what you know of Garrick tomorrow? Well, I, he, he must have been in this game since he was like five years old because he, he literally, has been around a very long time. He's done a lot of stuff. I mean, yeah. he's he's known for like ball pythons now, um, but you know, yeah, he's done used all, to be geckos, all sorts of big time geckos. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Super dwarf. He has a super dwarf line as well, which is fucking crazy. Like you know, he he, he was working with the with the retics, you know, for a little bit. I got on his uh, website, and I need to ask him about this. He actually worked at the Sedgwick Zoo in uh, wow. in Kansas. That is. Prime entry level, you know, they were they were the on the forefront of condros in this country. They were, yeah. Zoo, you know, I mean, it's that the Dallas Zoo, you know, those are really the two that I I can think of that were like the most, like they were they were in the shit, you know, with Trooper and the National Zoo, and so I, I want to hear. If his, you ever see uh, SCZ on a pedigree, that's what SCZ. that is. Yeah, yeah, and you'll see it a lot, and you'll see it way early, like in the seventies. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is going to be epic, and I think we should just stop fucking around already and just bring them on, because I'm ready to rock. Are you guys ready? Do it. All right, let's do let's it. Let's go. Hey, Marshall, by the way, why don't you, you know, you know, there's a huge, huge community in the live chats. Bill's great talking to people. <laughs> do, do you not care? I'm just kidding. <laughs> He doesn't know how to do it. That's I don't. Yeah, I'm, I'd rather, I'm like I'd rather, all my. No, I'd rather you know. Okay, it. I mean, <laughs> Bill. I'm not. I'm going to give it to Bill. He can multitask pretty well. Uh, but I don't recommend people looking at the comments during a podcast because it can kind of fuck. Yeah. But Bill, I, I, he's he, he does it and he he gets away with it. So uh, so I think you do great. Just do you, Marshall. I'm just, I'm just gonna block it out. I'm just gonna yeah. block it out. So hey, if something's happening, you guys tell me. <laughs> MJ, speaking. Uh, Speaking of the live comments, I just got to say real quick before we bring Garrick on, I had a visit from our friend Ro this week. Yeah, dude, he's shared in the goddamn group chats. Um, he, okay. I'm so happy, and I'm sure. I mean, you know, like, dude, visiting your place, Bill, and like, let's just say you don't keep condros, and you just go straight to your place. It's a whole life changing experience. It's already a life changing experience even when you do keep condros, but for someone to get put into that room, yeah. very, very green. You know, as far as knowing what these what these are, oh my god, he can't. He still he still can't stop talking about it. By the way, listen, it, it was his girlfriend's birthday, so of course he brought her to my place, and I could tell right away <laughs> what she was really looking forward to. So, so they drove from Louisiana, <laughs> and uh, I got to meet him and her, uh, and it was just a great couple hours. And so I wanted to just uh, I just want to say that's hi. awesome. It was good yeah. to see him again because I met him at, at Trap Fest, right? Yep, and he, yeah, and he ended up getting his first chondro when he came and visited. My here. man, so brings a tear, cool. brings a tear to my eye every single time. I love it. He's a good and, guy. And I think at some point we need to get the statistics on how many ball python people are converted to chondros each year by Bill Stegall. We'll see. Well, <laughs> let, well, well, let's let's talk to Garrick about it as well. <laughs> okay, guys, listen. If you're in the live chats too, all right, don't be, don't be shy with the super chats. If you have an important topic or question to to relate tonight's episode. Drop that super chat. Don't be shy, but it is game time, fellas. Why don't we do this? Let's bring the man on himself, Garrick DeMeyer. Do what you got to do to get your mind right. Do what you got to do to stay hydrated, like Bill Marshall for sure. Uh, but it's episode 439 coming at you right now. Let's go. Jeep! Good. You ready for do, do more in the future? Trap yes. Talk podcasts? Yes. Man. Oh. Only trap talk, exclusive. Yes, exclusive. exclusive. <laughs> oh, so stop calling us. <laughs> From the spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the crop, God love it, love it, and not them. Hop from the hop to the club to spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the club to spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the club to spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the club to spot, get the club.
Episode 439, live with Wisconsin's finest, Garrick DeMeyer, in the, hey, in, the real, in the real cold, huh, buddy? Yeah. How's it going, guys? What's you up, are Garrett? killing me, man. You are killing me. No, I didn't realize you were from Texas. I'm sorry. I might not have actually worn this if I would have known. Oh, yeah, you <laughs> would have. I'm afraid you have a headband on. I love it. I, I think if, if, Miguel, if Miguel Garcia's watching this, he just threw his phone across the fucking Vegas casino right now. Uh, yeah. love it i love it man go go packs let's oh, go yeah. jesus man what's going on though garrick how you doing buddy freezing i'm <laughs> uh, not currently in this room but outside yeah i don't even know if it hit zero today it's yeah i mean i know you guys have a cold and you guys aren't used to this but yeah it, yeah it, no you're you live with it you live with it day like day in day out but you know what? We've had an awesome winter so far. It's mostly been in the 30s and 40s. We didn't have any snow for Christmas, which is the first time I can remember in I don't know how many years. And next week it's supposed to be in the upper 30s again. So pretty happy about that. All right. Got to take what you can that's, get. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. right. Yeah. Garrick, Garrick, why don't we get to something real quick? Why, why have you been acting so humbly and like you almost felt like you're not good enough for this segment. And I want to know why you act that way after we, after I just found out that you worked at a zoo. So what, what is it about you feeling like you're not good enough for like telling us about what's going on with you and the chondros? I want to just hear right off the bat. I don't know. I mean, I pretty, I feel like I'm kind of a humble person overall. I mean, I don't, That's I don't true. know. Um, but no, I, I mean, I've, I've had chondros. I've actually been breeding green tree pythons as long as ball pythons, not nearly successfully though. I mean, like one one thousandth of the number of babies <laughs> ball python. So, you know, I, I mean, I, yeah, I got my first chondro in, in uh, 1997 and um, had it in a big, like a 70 gallon oceanic lizard lounge cage in my bedroom. And and um, then I eventually got a, a few more of them and started, you know, grew them up and started breeding them. And I've had, you know, some success with them. I mean, I got a few clutches this year, but uh, you know, the hatch rate on the babies isn't that good yet and, you know, having some issues with that. But I mean, overall, you know, I, I, I don't know. I just I haven't had a whole lot of experience with them other than keeping them for years and years. Well, I, you know, I want to get to kind of like, you know, the start as far as where you feel like you're kind of running into some bumps in the road. But before that, why don't you clarify as far as your history with the working at the zoo? Because I, I, you know, I've had you on the show before and I never spoke to you about that. So I'm curious about like. You know, you working at the zoo in Kansas City was that right, Bill? Or what? What, what zoo is this? Uh, Wichita, Kansas. Okay, yeah. What, what, let's hear about it. Yeah. So when I was in college, uh, we had a professor that would place his students. In, it was an animal physio animal physiology uh, class. He placed some of his students in internships over Christmas vacation, which is like three weeks in college. So um, in December, or, or actually, I guess it would have been. Yeah, like the end of December, early January, two, or, uh, 1996, um, I got an internship at the Sedgwick County Zoo in Wichita, Kansas, uh, with uh, one of my best friends that I went to college and high school with. Um, we we drove out there like on New Year's Day, drove all the way out to, from, we actually left Milwaukee. We were partying in Milwaukee on New Year's Eve with some friends of ours, got in the car, drove to uh, Wichita on New Year's Day, horrible weather conditions. It was a miserable drive out, out there, but uh, we had a, another keeper that we were signed up to stay with the entire time. And so I worked, we worked for three weeks there uh, just doing maintenance on the cages. We actually got to renovate. I think it was a, 
uh, either beaded lizard, a Gila monster cage or something like that. And yeah, they had some chondros there. And um, I mean, tons of other species. It was a great experience. Damn, that's crazy! And the year this is and, the and how did this happen again? You said this was this was for 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 school. Yeah, yep. It was a college professor it had a lot of uh, a lot of contacts throughout the country, and um, yeah, he he set up the internship for us, and we were able to drive out there and spend three weeks out there working at the zoo, and got to deal with everything except for the komodo dragons and anything venomous. But other than that, you know, I and you know this is. This is 1996, so I mean, I just started breeding reptiles three years earlier, maybe four years earlier. I've been keeping reptiles since I was, you know, four, five, six years old or whatever, but I'd never seen a lot of these species that I was working with at that zoo, and it was it was incredible. You know, I mean, there were green tree pythons. I don't really remember a ton of them. I mean, there were they had a few, but um, just the diversity of species overall was really incredible. So 1992 was your first year of breeding? I think that's the first year I actually hatched out anything, yeah. Wow, it was in my dorm room, actually. I had, um, I, I, wow. I, had a, I, think, I think it was 92. Uh, I had, so um, in my, my roommate, the one that did, did my internship with me, uh, him and I were rooming together in the dorms, and we had, our closets were full of reptile cages. Like, I remember he had a corn snake. We had, I think we might have each had a ball python. Um, I had a pair of giant day geckos on my, uh, desk in my dorm room. And that, those are the first species that I ever bred, uh, and I actually still have some babies or some, uh, animals from that lineage to this day yet. Um, uh, and I'm getting babies now and I don't even, I don't even know what to do with them. Like I'm hatching so many baby day geckos now. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, so we, so, Garrett, you were allowed to have reptiles in your no no <laughs> well, <laughs> you're, you're pretty sneaky about it i understood the closet but then you said you had them on your desk i got a really cool story to tell you okay so you guys probably all knew, know who walter payton is, was yeah. oh yeah fuck yeah so walter payton was on campus doing a tour of the university for some reason and uh so we're sitting hanging out in our dorm room with our door open and I just, for some reason, I heard voices outside of our room, like down the hall. And I look out the hall and there he's standing there with the head of the dorms for the university and oh, some, and I think the head of our dorm. And um, they came up to our room and they said, hey, would you mind if we showed Walter Payton what the inside of the dorm rooms look like? And I'm like, <laughs> oh, crap. Well, uh, I said, and then as they're coming in, they're like, don't worry, anything we see in here, we won't hold it against you. Probably think they'd see beer and stuff. Right. And uh, <laughs> they come in and they're looking at the reptiles and Walter Payton is sitting there asking questions about them and stuff. I had, we had a conversation about them and everything, like why I had them and what, what we were doing with them and everything. And it was just really, really cool. Like, wow, I've got an NFL Hall of Famer in my dorm room crazy uh, snakes with me and, and crazy. whatever. <laughs> walter uh, payton are you kidding sweetness. me yeah yeah sweetness. that's amazing yeah it was really cool sweetness sweetness yeah. <laughs> what a time now okay you said okay and i'm curious like you obviously you've had probably a thing for chondros from seeing them at the zoo and whatnot and and, and, and i want to know how you got into your first chondro like where you purchased it at and where that led to like the next purchase as far as chondros go when did you start building things from there well i i got my first one as a hatchling it was an aru hatchling uh from the lee watson's reptile swap which used to be wow. it's one of the oldest reptile swaps in the country it was in the chicago area actually in um streamwood illinois wow. uh, a little bit north west of tinley and um, I bought it there for seven hundred and fifty dollars. This is back in nineteen ninety seven, I think. And Damn. that's what they were for years. They were seven fifty a piece. Like if you look in the back of you know all the magazines and everything with the classified ads, they're always like right around seven fifty a piece for just a you know typical chondro. And I, I, these are I, import imports, right, Garrett? Garrett, like oh, I think this, this one was actually farm, captive bred, a uh, farm, farm baby or something. Uh, no, yeah, I Cap believe captive bred. Yeah, back yeah, I captive bred. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you could get uh, some captive bread for that price. Yeah, yep. So I I got her and and raised her up, and she you know like I said she was an Aru. Um, I bred her in two thousand and 
I think it was in 2000. No, that couldn't have been right. She was in 1990. It was right around 2000, 2001. I, I bred her. I got, I, I got a male since then. I bred her. And uh, I had her in a, a relatively small, like a 32-gallon uh, tank with uh, cocoa fiber substrate, a pothos plant. And I actually had like an ice cream bucket with a hole cut in the lid, like a gallon ice cream bucket, a hole cut in the lid with sphagnum moss inside of it. And she laid her eggs in there and the babies hatched. They got almost all, you know, all the eggs hatched and uh, had pretty good, pretty good luck with it that year. The next year or. Hey, so Garrick, I'm sorry. That was maternal incubation, by the way, when you did that. Maternal, yeah, maternal incubation. Yep. Wow. And, uh, yes. you know, and, and I'm kind of, I kind of want to get back into doing that. I just think that those, those snakes know how to do it so much better than I can. Uh, but the second clutch that I had, the um, mm. not from that female, but from a different one. So since I got that first one, I have bought in several more and raised them up and started breeding them. And uh, so I, I think at the time I had maybe, I think three pair. And um, the so my first clutch was maternal incubation, had a decent hatch rate. And there might've been one or two bad eggs in there, but pretty good hatch rate. Second one, I did maternal incubation again. Eggs went bad. Um, you know, I, I lifted her up one day and just a pile of junk under her. And uh, so I, uh, you know, that at, at that point, I kind of switched to artificial incubation. But I mean, honestly, since then, I've had pretty mixed luck with that. And uh, I think a lot of it's that I'm, I'm, my incubators, I'm kind of having a hard time getting the temperatures just right. But um, I think I might try to go back to our, um, uh, maternal incubation. We had, we had had Vin Russo on not too long ago, and he, you know, he's a big fan of maternal incubation. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think you provide the right general environment that they can, they can, you know, get the environment just right for the snakes. I mean, as long as the humidity and temperature is decent, you know, they can kind of do the rest and fine tune it and get those babies to hatch a lot better. Also, I feel like if it's a female that you've raised and it's so used to your room, yeah, they're kind of. I feel like I and like I, like I, you know, I'm not no one to really speak on this, but I'm just saying like I I keep thinking like your best bet is to let that those snakes cook those eggs versus a fucking you know goddamn refrigerator. You know what I'm saying or whatever it is that you use. Yeah, yep, I agree. But I, I, but I don't know. This is just based off like I mean I don't know. What do you guys think, Marshall and Bill? Like the more that you keep hearing about this maternal incubation talking and, and i know nobody in here could say that they're 100 on 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 hatch rate as far as cooking eggs in the incubator right bill no one's 100 percent, right well I'll, I'll tell you this um i'll start with saying i tell people all the time usually it's their first chondro uh clutch maybe they've only hatched out a few clutches of other species and if your incubator is not just and egg boxes aren't just dialed in i mean dialed in let the mom cook the eggs, you know, mm. because if you don't have a lot of experience doing it or you haven't cut your teeth on, you know, I, I tell people all the time, it took, I spent three years dialing in my incubator, killing ball python eggs. Um, but once I got it dialed in, you know, the first bunch of condors I had, it hatched flawlessly. And, um, but, you know, if there's any doubt with your setup, your incubator, your egg box, let the mom do it. Bill, I have to ask you, what what was it you felt that got your incubator dialed in? Well, for me, I think the big my biggest problem was two things. I had inconsistent temperatures, so I would have twenty four hour fluctuations of a of a degree or more. And uh, initially, for me, my incubator and my egg boxes would dry out, mm -hmm. and so I tweaked. You know, te Technically speaking, if your egg box is set up right, you shouldn't have to worry about humidity in the incubator. I mean, the right. egg box should do all of the, you know, control all the humidity if it, everything's set up right. That wasn't the case for me. If my incubator humidity was 20% or 30%, didn't matter what I did in those egg boxes, the eggs would go dry. So oh. when I, when I, fi you know, when I figured that out and I tweaked the incubator and you know, I've got one incubator that holds humidity great, I've got another one that I need to run, you know, a big pan of water on the bottom. It gets the ambient humidity in that incubator into the 60s, and then that's what really kind of fixed the problem. And, and why don't we talk about with you and incub incubation, Marshall, you, you've, you've had your ways of doing things for a while, and I'm sure that you have – 
things that you don't want to really fuck with because they this seems to you seem to be happy with how you incubate your eggs, right? Yeah, yeah, and I, I've tried it all different kinds of ways. I've never I, I've never really had a big problem with hatching the eggs. I mean, I've I've done it in vermiculite. I've done it open egg box, closed egg box, water in the bottom of the incubator, dry. I mean, I've I've done it uh, a ton of different ways, and um, the eggs always have, have hatched for me. I've never really had a problem hatching them. Um, it's the it's the you know obviously the feeding of the babies that that that's that's been the hardest thing. But as far as hatching the eggs, um, if they're good eggs to start with, uh, I've you know never had any problems with them going the distance. And the, you'll always have that one one clutch that's odd, and you know they'll just die. You know, take a nose dive right after a couple of weeks. But I don't really. I don't know that I blame that on the equipment as much as that those eggs were, you know, doomed to to begin with. Depending on how they go, you know, obviously if they're they're desiccating and drying out, like like you know, Bill is saying you're saying your humidity wasn't um, right. That's one thing. But um, uh, you know, I, like I hadn't had any problems. More flux. I talk to people, it seems like almost every week, and they say, I had great eggs. They'll show me pictures of well-developed, well-veined eggs with a great embryo, mm -hmm. and they kill that damn clutch in the incubator. And really? That's what it seems to me. I mean, I'm telling you, it's, it seems like it's weekly. It's probably monthly. But so what interesting. are you doing? Are you a consistent I do. Yeah. I put them at the top of my incubator with ball pythons, and and uh, th it's set at eighty eight. And mine at the at the very top is about, you know, a a, a degree or so cooler, yeah. Because the heat comes out at the bottom of mine, yeah. and uh, I just put them on the top shelf, and that's it. No no substrate, uh, just over water. I mean, it's they're actually over perlite, but it's saturated perlite, you know, just right. to keep the water from from sl from sloshing around. Yeah. Marshall, um, and keep, then, Marshall, where do you keep your probe in the incubator? Right in front of the fan, which is up top. Yeah. Okay. And what are you gonna say? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. But, I, but no, I was gonna say. I mean, I've hatched them in a cooler, you know, igloo cooler before. I got the, you know, before I got a nice incubator, had it just igloo cooler incubators, and uh, did them egg box with the lid on. Did them where I humidified the whole cooler, you know, with a couple of open pans of water uh, on vermiculite, uh, no substrate. I mean, I've tried it a million different ways, and this to me, I, what I use today is because because it's the simplest. You don't have to, you know, yeah, you don't have to mix the vermiculite and, you know, because if, if you would think if they're prone to drying out that having them in the vermiculite would be, could be helpful, right? Um, but if you get the vermiculite too wet, then it doesn't take long for them to go bad, you know? Yeah. So, but with, with no substrate and I guess, you know, apparently it's the egg boxes that I use are, are kind of dialed in for it. You know, they don't uh, have a lot of air exchange. Um, and, you know, yeah, just do them over, over uh, saturated perlite on a what piece of plastic egg crate. You're thinking like 87 to 87.5, somewhere around there for temperature? That, yeah, that's what, that's what men are. But it's in that, but you would say it's in that range though, huh, Marshall? It's also kind of like, like it's not stuck at a certain temp the entire time. Like you have a little bit of fluctuation, you would say. I mean, it's pretty consistent. My incubator, like, I mean, if it's within a, a, I don't know, I'd have to look at my data. I mean, but it was when I when I checked it, it was good enough for, you know, good enough. What you know, which I would uh, half a degree, half a degree, between seventy to seventy-five. I mean, if you get it much tighter than that, I mean, that's pretty. I don't know. I don't know if I believe anybody that says they've got it much tighter than half a degree, you know? Because I, 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 some people would might overthink, like, that might be damaging. But really, like, you're going to have a tiny bit of a point-something fluctuation, and that's okay. Like, if that's... Yeah, I mean, you're going to... You, you, you open the door. Like, you open the door, the temperature yeah. changes a little bit. Yeah. I've had clutches where I've, I've opened the cooler and fanned fresh air. Like, the, the times that uh, I did it and I put the you know, made the whole incubator chamber humid, I would open the 
the, the lid up and fan fresh air on the eggs every couple of days. Um, just to, you know, give them some, some, some fresh air. And remind me for the record, Marshall, you do have holes the whole time or you, or you air holes throughout. Nah, or no, I ha holes? it's got, it's got like one quarter inch hole. Most of my boxes do because I used to stick a thermistor probe through them. Oh. Mm -hmm. Um, but now I just put a piece of scotch tape over the, over the hole. So they're not ventilated at all. Yeah. But at a certain point, do you move that tape or it's, it's always taped is what you're saying. I, I mean, maybe I'll move it at the end. If there's a bunch, if there's a bunch of eggs in there and they're really like fogging up the box, you know, cause they're, 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 they're generating heat. Um, I'll, I might either, you know, barely crack the lid or pull the tape off the hole. And that helps a little bit, but really towards the end, I'm, I'm open in the egg box, like every pretty day. much if, if not yeah. every day, every other day and just fanning fresh air on them, you know? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now let's hear, let's hear what you've been doing, Garrick, as far as temperatures in your incubator, what, what has been your go-to as far as what you've experienced so far? Well, I generally try to keep them in the, um, like right around 87 to 88 degrees. Um, I, I heard that lowering the temperature towards the end of incubation is good for the eggs, but this last clutch that I had this year um, or last year did not go very well. I actually only ended up with one live baby out of the whole clutch. Did you so, lower it, Garrick? Did you? I did. did. I, I moved it to a lower spot in the incubator. My the incubator I was using the higher temperatures are at the top and lower temperatures at the bottom. I think I, I lowered them a little bit too much and killed most of them. But I mean, I had I had uh, five clutches in all this year. Um, four, one clutch was completely infertile, but I, I did get babies out of the four other clutches. The last clutch was the one that I I used the most. I severely dropped the temperature the most, and that's the clutch I only had one baby from. Um, the other clutches I did better, but I still didn't end up with that many babies considering I had that many clutches. A um, mm -hmm. lot of lot of uh, full term. Uh, babies in the egg dead. So, did you wow. pip them or, or no? What's that? Did you pip them or did you let uh, them? Let them I, after the first couple pipped, I pipped the rest of them. Marshall, he's a ball python guy. Of course, he pipped them. Yeah, come on now. Cutting, cutting <laughs> your thing. <laughs> well, I, you know, I just, I, I don't know. Yeah, maybe that is my ball python brain working, but um, Eric, I, I pip them too. I'm just, I'm, I am, I'm just messing with you. I'm a no, I'm, guy too. I pick. No, I, I'm here to learn. Believe me, I'm I'm gonna get as much information out of you guys, probably a lot more <laughs> than you'll get out of me. No I'm way. No way. That's not how it works here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. All right. So why don't why don't we have an open an open platform question about this real quick? Because I've definitely had and I, and I lied to myself. What I thought was a, like a scratch on the egg or a pip, but I've cut a fucking goddamn egg. I think on day fifty two where it actually poked its head out the next day. And then I took that as, well, I could cut the rest open. And I think I cut open like nine other ones. And I would say eight out of those nine all died. And they were like fully formed. And, 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 and I will tell you, a lot, of, a lot of things that people told me and, and were like, you cut those eggs way too early. And I was like, what? And, and I want to know what you guys feel about that. Like if, it's a, if, it, that's, if a snake's fully formed and it just never came out of the egg, did something cause did me cutting that egg cause something to kill that snake inside the egg? Well, that's what happened with my, a lot of time. The, the eggs, I mean, the, the eggs that never pipped, uh, the babies were fully formed and dead in the egg. So, but I mean, I, I always tell people like with ball pythons that the, if, especially if you're a beginner, never pip, never cut any eggs until the first baby pips on its own. And I, would, I think the green tree pythons, you'd have to be even more cautious about that. But with ball pythons, yeah, I mean, I tell people, don't don't just go for a specific day. Like, oh, it's day 55, I have to cut the eggs. Absolutely. You cut the eggs after the first baby pips, and then you're okay. But before that, nope, don't do it. Unless Garrick, you can feel the eggs, and you just know they're ready to hatch. Garrick, we're all here to learn, right? So can I yeah, keep going? Oh, hold on, I got to say something real quick, because I got to stop Garrick in his tracks. I want to I wanna tell you what I did. This was totally accident, by the way. Fuck it. Okay. Swear to God, this isn't no, you know, I'm just saying, this was not on purpose. But I accidentally cut a clutch of ball python eggs, like on day 41 or something, or day 40. Um, and, on that. 
and 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 but but they all came out perfectly fine. Like mm-hmm. it was just it was just kind of like a like I noticed I was like, dude, these aren't really as ready as I thought they would be ready. And I looked and I just never messed with them. And dude, they they came out rocking. Like if they like if you just had like a little window to look at, that's all that was. And yeah. I I don't think ball ball pythons I feel like just are a lot more sturdier than a chondro. A chondro yeah, chondro. they're much stronger babies than chondro babies are for sure. And I wish that wasn't the case. I wish they were even. <laughs> well, then there'd be a million chondros around. <laughs> Although hatching them is one thing, getting them all to feed and to be to the get to the point where you can actually sell them is another thing. I mean, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll say they're tough. I'll say this: any any that um, like I don't pip most of the time, but it's not because um, I don't think that that would kill them necessarily. Mm-hmm. I, agree. I I worry about when I pip them. When when the the problem most of the time is they hatch too soon and they don't uh, fully absorb their uh, yolk, mm-hmm. so every t- not every time but a lot of the times when I when I pip them manually, even if it's a you know a day after the first one, they'll come out and they'll be dragging like a you know a grape size yolk sack around with them and it'll be like a six gram baby. With yeah. you know dragging around ten grams of yolk, uh, yeah. that's why I, that's why I don't like to cut. I don't know if like just the the you know moving them around or them feeling it or you know it kind of makes them think they have to come out sooner than, than they're really ready. Um, that's the problem I've had. Not not necessarily that that you pip them and then they don't ever they don't ever come out. You know. You know, and I think I mean I know the whole reason for pipping is that well, what if the snake can't cut its way out of the egg? And, you know, the, the number of babies you lose because of that versus maybe yeah. giving them too early is is minor. I mean, snakes are made to be able to get their way out I of the eggs. If they're not able to get out of the eggs, they're probably not meant to live. And, you know, how, how, many, 100%. Babies, how many babies or how many clutches would you have to have to have a baby that just can't get out of the egg versus all the ones that can get out of the egg? I mean, it's just, it's just nature. I mean, they should, you know, they can get out of those eggs on their own. So why why go through and pip them or, you know, cut the eggs. I think the one thing with ball pythons, you know, as far as what I could relate to, as far as the amount of reps you get with ball pythons, like you, you, you don't have to wait as long for your next clutch as far as for, at least for me with ball pythons. And, and I never really had an issue with ball pythons, but with chondros, if you fuck up one clutch, you got to wait. I mean, for me, it's like, God damn, I got to wait a long time for my next. (laughs) You know what I mean? Chondro Um, year's done, right? Right, exactly. You know, but now we're kind of leading to where now I have more things as far as numbers. But numbers is everything. What did you guys say? Like the more reps you get, the more you kind of quicker get to a place where you feel like you're like in the like you're in the fucking in the good zone of where you have things at, either incubating incubation, pairing things up. But it's it's just getting more reps. What did you guys say? It's always a numbers game. Always. Right. Yeah. That's a, it's a big part of it. Like as far as figure out like what you did wrong here, what you did wrong there, you just need to see it more and more and more. That's, I feel like that's a huge part of it. Um, and, and, but also that comes with time too. You can't force that. Like it is what it is. What are you going to do? You know? Um, yeah. and, and now with you, Garrick, I, I, numbers wise, like you told me, uh, what's the average chondro clutches you've had throughout the last 10 years, as far as each year goes, like we're, we're not about- very many. Pro- I probably have averaged like one clutch a year for the past, seven or eight years um this year i i my i i well so over the past few years i've been holding back a lot of the babies that i've been producing raising those up so from basically like 2013 through 2017 i kept most of the babies that i've hatched out i I sold some extra males i just wanted an equal number of males versus females so i can pair them up in the late fall early winter and leave them until you know the or leave them until late winter, early spring, and then whichever ones are grab it or grab it. And uh, so I have a total of six pairs going right now. Um, I have a seventh female that I I haven't started pairing yet for this year. And then I have an older female uh, that I haven't bred with anything yet, Um, but she hasn't produced. I can't even remember last time she produced. She's probably like 15 years old or something like that. So, um, you know, I, I guess I have a total of eight females in my collection. And this last season, I had five, what was it, four, five, five out of six females go. 
but the female of, of the six younger females that I have, so five out of the six females went this last year in 2023. The, the female that didn't go this year gave me clutches the two previous years. So, um, yeah, and she's, she's, I think, grabbing now, or at least she's, she's on her way to be. I don't mess with them so, a whole lot during the. Five out, of, five out of six is really good. Like, that's all. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't that is believe it. Yeah. And, and Derek answered one of my questions about resting females. Nobody's got. Um, time. I was gonna, yeah, I was gonna ask if 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 you gave him a year off or not. Yeah, yeah. Um, I will a lot of times. I don't all the time. It just depends. Like I, I feel like if a female is able to breed and able to produce eggs, she will. And if she's not, she just won't. So I don't really see a whole lot of harm. Now, this is probably more of my ball python part of my brain talking, but, um, you know, with my ball pythons, if I want to breed a female in multiple years in a row, I will. Yeah. And I figured, well, if she's not ready to produce eggs again, she just won't. Right. So, um, I mean, that, that first chondro that I got back in 1997, she laid like eight out of nine years in a row. Crazy. It, it was unbelievable. Oh, wow. Yeah, that is unbelievable. Yeah. But I'm, but I'm curious, like, how many people out there could say they've had a chondro breed year after year, and she's over the age of ten? That's what I want to know. Not, well, a, not that, many that, females. That's no. true. Because that, my, that first one of mine, she died. I think she was probably about fourteen or fifteen years old, and yeah. I have some now that are much older than that. Wow. And, and like you said, ball pythons. Like I have my very first ball python that got me that started all this, 2015. She's giving me her sixth clutch, and and I just feel like she naturally bounces back. She's a big snake, like she she does her thing, um, and 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 I feel like a lot of people have ball pythons like that that live at the age of like 15, 20 years old, you know. And, and again, we're talking about a snake. I feel like that can handle a lot more, and and, and versus a chondro that you know you, you breed year after year, regardless if she could give you age or not, that has to have some sort of toll. It, to, the yeah. point where, to the point where they can't even live past the age of 10. You know what I'm saying? Right. Well, I, I have actually my first bumblebee I ever hatched, bumblebee ball python I ever hatched in 2005. I still have her. She's going strong. She's she's 19 years old. She'll be 19 yeah. this summer. And I have a, a female from 2001 that's still – I don't breed her anymore, but she's doing right. fine. I, I know she breed for me fine. But Condors are just different than that. You know, I, I, I don't, I think it would probably be best to give them a year off. Um, hey, 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 but Marshall, that's not the case with the males, huh, for Zachi? <laughs> no, Zachi, no gee, males. Bro. Yeah. Males, males are a whole other story. Let's just say that. I've got a male. So, with, but did you, I have a male that I hatched out that's 19 years old now, a Condro. That's epic. Um, yeah. I, I actually, he hatched in 2005. And, uh, you know, so the babies, I do everything I can to get them to survive. If they don't eat on their own, like, I, I feel like a third of my babies will eat on their own fine by the time they, you know, like a, maybe a week or two weeks after shed. Some of them take a little bit more coaxing and some of them just will not eat anything no matter what I do. And those I assist feed uh, a very small pinky a week and eventually they either come around or they don't. And but most of them end up coming around. Well, this one... Um, I hatched him and I couldn't get him to eat. And one day I looked at his, and this is back in 2005, so I didn't have as much experience back then. But I, you know, I looked at him and he was like kind of laying on the floor of his cage. And I'm like, oh man, he's he's a goner. I should probably euthanize him. And I just, I'm like, I I hate like putting an animal down. So I just avoided it and I just put the drawer back in, put the tub back in the drawer, and I'm like, I'll deal with this tomorrow. And it came back the next day and all of a sudden, oh, he's back up on his perch. Okay. Offered him a pinky, slammed it. He's still alive 19 years later. Damn. I couldn't believe it. That he, how, how, how old was he at the point when he started eating? I don't really remember exactly. Uh, I would say probably, you know, eight or nine weeks or something like that. Okay. So she, he wasn't too like far on. Like he was, you know, but okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah, but I, I just I can't. So did you that. did you say earlier that you've had you have females that are what well, Garrick, were you saying earlier that you have females that are 15, 14, 15 years old that I have that uh, you've bred pretty much not every year, but but you know back to back years a lot. 
No, I, I mean, I don't have, I have one female that's about that old right now and I haven't bred her in several years. I'd like to breed her and get another clutch out of her though. I mean, she's big, she's healthy, she looks awesome. Most of my other females are actually, they hatched in 2013 and 2015. And, but I didn't start breeding them uh, until I think the first ones that started breeding was like in 2021. So, I mean, those are the 2013. So I let them go forever. I raised my green tree pythons really slowly. Okay. I don't, okay. I'm, I'm so distracted by all of all pythons and everything else I've got going on that, you know, I feed them once a week, a smaller size meal, and I just let them grow up nice and slow. And, and um, you know, they, you know, it was probably like, they were probably like six years old before I even thought about breeding them. And I'm like, huh, these things have been sitting here for a long time and they look pretty good. I should probably start breeding them right about now. So then I started, but I mean, they, they had a lot of time to get mature muscle mass and everything. And they look really good yet. Garrick, you're such the opposite of like most people that we have on or talk about green trees, you know, they're like moving the calendar every day, you know, to try <laughs> to get, is she three and a half? You know, she's is she four yet. You know, it's like watching paint dry, you know, everybody's just so anxious to, you know, I'll get, get it you going. Know, you know, my secret is have another, uh, have about, 700 ball python breeders <laughs> and 1500 babies sitting around and you'll be too busy to even think about breeding those green tree pythons. I love it. I the, last love thing it. You want, awesome. the last thing you want to do is have a pile of green tree python babies that you're all of a sudden like, oh shit, now I got to get these things to eat. Dude. Yeah, I don't want to deal with that. Yeah. <laughs> There's just so many things about the green tree pythons where you just don't, you're better off not thinking about it. Like just, if you could get your mind off that, that, whatever it is that you're thinking about either pairings or trying to get this thing to eat whatever like yeah don't put that energy fucking thinking about it because it's draining because once you get to that where you have to deal with it you're already like you're already losing like you're already like in your head you're already mentally fuck you literally got to get distracted and not fucking think about it because it it, ha it happens if it happens you know what I'm MJ, saying? i know that your your main focus is really going into our arboreals and stuff but keep some ball pythons because you'll have little successes with those all the time and then <laughs> Your green tree python troubles will not bother you quite as much. I already know. Listen, I that at the end of the day, I have stuff on my resume I'm successful at, all right? And that is the ball pythons, and I'm keeping that shit. I got to keep my resume pretty, all right? So, and, and I got to tell you, I do have fun with the ball pythons because I, I hang out with relevant people in the ball python game, and it's fun, and there's awesome stuff that I have going on. So I will always – honestly, too, Garrick, I will I've always give – my credit to the ball python all this came from ball pythons everything oh, yeah. else, everything you see right here birthed mm -hmm. from ball pythons um ball pythons are never going anywhere okay for sure uh so i can guarantee you that buddy don't worry about it it's but, just yeah. it's just the numbers are a lot lower now let's just say oh, that <laughs> smart thing yeah i mean uh, i love green tree pythons if i could but you know if i didn't have to make an income from this like a stable income because you guys know green tree pythons are not exactly a stable income but uh, you know, the ball pythons provide stability for me, uh, yeah. but and the green tree pythons are just like a side project that, that I do because I love. I mean, I, I made the decision probably back in like 2012 to get rid of all species of snakes that I had except for ball pythons. And because I, I was tired of take, doing having too many different care regimens with too many different species, right. but I'm, like, I'm not getting rid of the green tree pythons. I never will because if there's only like if I could, if you had to tell me I can only keep one snake. And it would not be a ball python to be a green tree python. It would be a green tree python sitting right here in my office or wherever. Um, but I, I mean, green tree pythons are my favorite species of snake, uh, at least any of any that I've ever kept. And I, that's that's the one I would pick if I could only have one. Hey, hey, Derek, we haven't talked much about. So what what are you keeping and breeding? Are these locality animals that you have? Not really. They're they're mostly Aru, but I've got some sarong mixed into them. They're they're more or less mutts. I mean, they're most of my green tree pythons actually came from. Let's see, see, Brett uh, just yeah. dropped some cash. Shout to Benny. <laughs> Thanks, Brett. Uh, no, most of my green tree pythons actually originated from that original aru female that i had but I, I don't have any documentation on the locality or anything but i mean yeah. she looked like a pretty typical aru um, and most of my others that i have were from aru descent uh but 
I mean, the the breeders that I have now, I mean, a lot of them are, are dark green with some blue on them and some white scales, but I've got some that have some yellow on them. I mean, they're just kind of a mix. Um, you know, I, I just don't, I don't have anything like locality documented or anything. Uh, I did have, uh, years ago, I did have some of the canary uh, green tree pythons. Uh, and those didn't really didn't you get some from me early on too? Like at Daytona, I remember trading you for ball for some like I, I forget maybe like albino ball pythons or, or something. We did a trade, and you yeah, got a couple of I think uh, that was that actually. Um, I got what? I got two males from a blue line that you were working with. Um, it does you ever do anything for you? I still have them. Um, they have never really. Read female i cannot get them to breed anything and it's they're they look awesome they're blue i mean they're like solid blue but i cannot get them to breed anything and i'm gonna try with that that bigger older female that i have i'm gonna try i'll probably try both of them with them this uh, this season yet and uh, i i want some babies out of them it's so weird I, you know i don't even know how many condors have hatched over the, the years probably i mean it's, i know it's over a hundred but probably you Quite a, probably a few more than that, but I've never produced anything other than a yellow, and I want to produce reds. And the, the ones that I got from you, I think, were red when they hatched. And yeah, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they're, they're fantastic looking, but man, I they just don't want to breed anything. And I'm like, interesting. And, uh, I don't know. It's weird, but damn, yeah, so I, over a hundred. Wait, over a hundred neonates. You're saying, and not one red. Never a red. Nope, Mark. No, Mark you Hager, work with Mark, Arus that they're all yellow. Yeah. Mark, Mark, Mark yeah. Hager's like, hooray! He's yeah. And so is so is Ryan Young. He's going, yellows are gonna take over the world. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know. Maybe I need to get some more new blood in my collection to get some different colors in there. But uh hey, yellow, hey, yellow hey. babies are really pretty too. After an after an episode like this, I guarantee doors open up for you, buddy. Let's just say that. I guarantee it. So let's uh but li what I want to get at though, hold on, is let's do a little quiz right now, fellas, on, on Garrick, okay? Um, he's a ball python guy, as we know, and but he's also a chondro guy. So there's he has a lot of maybe ball python habits, right? What are the odds, or what do you guys think as far as him being a uh, strictly mouse or mice diet chondro breeder, or is he implementing rats? Do you think it's mm -hmm. mice or rats? Who you go first, uh Marshall, what do you think? He's doing rats or mice for his dogs? I think I think uh, I think he's doing an appropriately sized rat. Bill, Eric's an old school guy. Um, I'm gonna have to agree with Marshall. An appropriate sized rat. Okay. And I'm gonna go with the majority vote right now. I'm gonna go with that as well. I, I feel like you go with a good size. Not big, obviously. I'm just saying you go with a, an appropriate size rat uh, as far as for your big females or whatever it is that you're feeding. And hit us with it. What's the truth, Garrett? I give them whatever I have available. I give them mice and rats. Nice. I, I switch them back and forth. I mean, my males are more likely to give mice to than the females. Good but answer. I'll give the females like a jumbo-sized mouse. But I'll give the males a large mouse. You know, one week, the next week, I give them rats. It just kind of depends on what I've got surplus of when I'm feeding all the ball pythons. I'm like, okay, I got all these extra mice and rats. Well, I'll just, you know, just feed them out. And so I do both. Garrett, what about what about ASFs? I breed I breed mice, rats, and, and ASFs here. I'm not self-sufficient on any of them, but I'm working towards, at least with the ASFs and mice, I'm working towards being self-sufficient. But Given the number said, of all pythons that I have, I won't ever be self-sufficient on those. I just don't have the manpower and I don't have the, the space to breed enough rats. But um, I'm I'm completely fine with I mean, I've given my condors ASF from time to time, too. Yeah, great. Yeah, I've started introducing ASFs into my uh, feeding as well. I love them. I, you, I, I think they're for ball pythons i think they're the best food source for green tree pythons i think they work just great i'd probably rather feed them an asf than a mouse um yeah. but you know versus a rat i, I don't know but i, I mean if, if it was easier for other people to get asfs i would much rather feed everything in my collection asfs than mice or rats actually. yeah my my bill's pr uh, production the uh jaeger to clover the red neo that i got from you bill yeah uh, it's just only been on asf since i've had it and i'm running like a little experiment on it 
And yeah. boy, dude, this thing is fucking beasty. Like it's already going into its OTC. And I'm just, I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, just I'm, I'm interested to see what how what, what this goes, you know? Yeah. So like I've really been hooked on them in two scenarios. One feeding neos because an ASF pink already has hair on it. Mm-hmm. And so to me, that's a big advantage to a mouse pink that doesn't. They're also bigger though. That's oh, yeah, I, I'm not saying you can feed it, you know, first five meals, but oh, after okay. its fifth after its fifth meal, I found that a, a baby green tree can take uh, you know a day old ASF, mm-hmm. and a, and an ASF pink, you know, it, it has you know it has that hair on it, which yeah. tiny bit of yeah, little, little whiskers. It's cool, just little tiny whiskers. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing that I've I've been encouraged by is feeding um, breeding females ASFs. Mm. I agree with you, Garrick, and I've read some stuff about ASFs and the nutritional value, mm-hmm. and it seems to be really just a great food source. Yeah. They really pack a lot of nutritional punch in a small-sized package. Yep. So I've gone to feeding my, you know, particularly breeding females um, ASFs. They, they're just denser. You know, if you pick up, like, even, like, a fuzzy ASF versus a mouse yeah. size, they're You're just right. more there's more density, like it's just heavier. Yeah. I just feel like it's it's got more nutrition in it. And I don't have any science to back this up, but just feel like it's a better source of food than a mouse. Well, I, I, I know who we can call to get the scientific data, but I, I, I have seen some nutritional studies on ASFs looking at, you know, you know, protein content and, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, bone structure and all that. It, it looks favorable. Sounds now, good. now, what, what has been your go-to for your first um, offering to a con- baby chondro? You you do a, a day-old pink, or do you get you let them age a couple days as far as the first offering to a neonate? Yeah, I usually let them. You know, once they shut out, I'll usually leave them sit for at least a few days. Um, and you know, I mean, not a few, but you know, like three or four days. Uh, and then I'll offer them like a day old pinky. And I've tried using chick down, uh, you know, on them as well. And that, I don't really think I've ever had any success with that. The clutches that I had this year with my, the problem feeders in the clutch, it didn't really seem like it did a whole lot. Now with some of these, so all my babies this year hatched over the summer. I had like a clutch in June, a, cl- a clutch in July, a clutch in August. And uh, I, I still have some that I'm assist feeding. I think I'm down to, four out of all my babies and I'm still assist feeding, but, you know, maybe I'll revisit the chick down at this point because, you know, just teasing them with, with pinky mice doesn't really seem to be doing a lot. I I can't even really get a lot of them. They're starting to strike a little bit more, but I just cannot get them to strike and, you know, grab onto it and constrict it. Whereas the other ones seem to come along a lot quicker. Um, and I did have one that I just recently, like maybe three weeks ago, got to take a pinky on its own for the first time. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, generally I try like day old pinkies with them for their first meal. And then I, I try to move up in size as quickly as I can without overwhelming them and giving them something that they have a chance to regurgitate or anything. So um, yeah, and I feed them once a week and that's what it, I'll be feeding them again tomorrow. So. I'll have some uh, stressful moments tomorrow getting those last four little bastards to take a meal. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Now, now, okay, your choice of like substrate for a neonate, like do you put paper towel or do you put them straight over water? Like, what what is it that works for you? I actually actually got them on cocoa chips. Uh, okay. I use the uh, the reptile perch. Uh, they're they're like six quart tub size. Uh, I've got those, and then I've got uh, cocoa chips underneath them. I just feel like it gives them a more even humidity uh, in my facility, and they've got a you know they've got a water bowl suspended in there to drink out of, and um, I have had pretty good success with that. I would imagine for you, it's a it's got to be a pretty hard keeping the humidity up as 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 cold as it is, and as much as you have to heat, huh? Does it is it dry your does it dry everything out? Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. My facility it has radiant heat in the floor, 
So I actually spray down, I have concrete floors. So I spray down the floors every night before I leave. So oh, the, wow. the, the water, oh, that's cool. cool. It, it, it evaporates and keeps the humidity high. That's but, a great, that's a great idea. idea. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it works for my situation. I mean, not everybody can just spray water all over their floors and have that, you know, end well for them. But, um, but that's, that's what I'm able to do. And, and plus with keeping the cocoa chips in there for substrate, it, it, I think the humidity inside of the actual tub is is pretty good for them. I, I never have any shedding issues or, you know, dehydration or anything like that. So I think it's probably pretty good. Wow, that's pretty interesting. I never heard of yeah. like, spray the floor down and my floor gets warm at night. That's tight as shit. Um, so what's your floor made out of? Concrete? Or- it's concrete, yeah. And there's there's hot water pipes like radiant heat everywhere on the floor. I've got one thermostat that operates the radiant heat, and then I've got another thermostat that operates the force there. And I can I actually keep the radiant heat set at a constant. I think right now I've got it at like 77 degrees. So it never lets the room get below 77 degrees. And then the force there is actually set to air conditioning, even now in winter. And I have that set uh, for like at nighttime. I have it set for like 80. So it'll never get below 77, but it'll never get above 80 in that room. And then during the day, I have it set a little bit higher so that the daytime temperatures can rise a little bit more. But my building is so well insulated that if I just didn't run anything and it just let let everything sit, it would stay pretty warm in there because heat does not escape my building at all. Wow. So, so, so you built it specifically for this, for this use? Yep. Yeah, I built my facility in 2003. I think we started moving animals in there in 2004. And, um, you know, I did the best that I could at the time. It's basically a, like a, you know, a metal pole building with a concrete floor. And there's multiple, there's one big room and then there's multiple smaller rooms and storage rooms and, and a furnace room and an office. And, um, you know, it was, it was the most that I could have possibly afforded back when I did it. And, uh, you know, it's definitely not as nice as some of the newer facilities that you see people putting up now. But, um, but you know, I'm, I did the best that I could at the time with the income that I was making. I mean, I was, you know, I was relying on like gecko money and bearded dragon money and veiled chameleon money back then when I built this thing. So I, I uh, you know, it was everything I could do just to get this building up and going and get everything in there. Yeah, it works. Obviously, it, it works too. Yeah, it, it works. It works well enough. There are things I love to change about it, and I would love to build a brand new facility. But you know, at this point now, like, I, why bother? You know, I, I mean, I just, I just don't want to. It, it'd be, it would cost me three times as much to build the current facility that I have, and ten times as much to actually build the facility that I really, really want. Yeah. So. And yeah, I, I, I want to not that I'm going to ever not that I can think of ever retire completely, but I want to scale back and I have to work so hard someday. So I'm not willing to take on like another, you know, million dollar mortgage or anything like that. On, on <laughs> right. You know, 51 years old. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to kill myself working at this. No. <laughs> Yeah, so how are you how are you keeping your adults in this in the room? Are you keeping them like in a and I'm assuming like some kind of. Uh, like what's your enclosure situation like for your adults my enclosures are nothing special they're actually vision cages uh 24 inch by 24 inch by 24 inch i think and they're all stacked on top of each other and i've got them all in those and that's that's all i have right now i'd love to get different cages for them and do something a little bit uh nicer but um but I mean, it, it works, you know, I'm having a hard time switching up something that's working fine for me. The enemy of good Are you is giving better. Him... What's that? I just said the enemy of good is better. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, I, I use visions too. I, I, I love mine. Um, are you are you you have any supplemental heat going in them or are they just ambient to the room? Not much. I've actually got LED spotlights on them and um and uh, the fluorescent lights along the back uh, screen strip that's on the back of them. And, and that's yep. it. Um, I probably will add some, a small heat pad. Like I've got them stacked uh, two wide and, and three high. And I, I'm thinking I probably will put a heat pad between each one of them just to give a little bit of extra heat. But I mean, I've had them set up like this for a couple of years now and they're doing fine. So, uh, and my, my ambient temperature in my room is fairly warm too. So, 
you know, the room is, you know, 83 degrees, I would say during the day in summer, those LEDs aren't putting out a whole lot of heat, but a little bit anyway. And, um, and the inside of the cages are a little bit warmer than outside. So, I mean, they're doing fine. You know, they're roughly in the mid eighties. Don't need it. Don't need any more heat than, than that. Don't need any more heat than that. That's for sure. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. You know, it, I mean, I could probably, if I sell all the babies that I have right now, I could probably go out and buy a bunch of new nice cages and stuff, but like <laughs> it, it works fine the way I've got it. So I don't really need to change yeah. it. Yeah. Let me know if you want to sell those visions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <wow>. Marshall. <laughs> Fucking Marshall. Marshall. No, hey, but listen, I mean, I've, I've, I was told by Bill, Marshall, and many other experienced conjure guys, like, it's it's kind of not smart to change things when you've already had them for so long. Like, you know what I mean? Especially if you're still on your way and your cusp of figuring things out and you're, you know, like, dude, five for six, that's pretty great. Like, you know what I mean? I feel like whatever's happening in your room, whatever's meant to go, will go, which is a good, that's a good sign, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and Gary, did I tell you this episode was going to be great? Look who's here. Gary Shavino, he doesn't pop in every now and then. Nice. It's a rare occasion. You know it's what I mean? It's a rare sighting for sure. Gary Gino, he says, question, why is Gary, <laughs> why is Gary better than you? Answer, he sprays his fours down at night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That's epic. <laughs> hey, shout out to Gary Shabino, GS Reptiles. Love you, buddy. Um, I have to ask, Gary, what's the time of year you're mostly experiencing ovulations and when your girl's laying, like at what point of the year? Well, considering that last year was the first year I actually had multiple clutches in a year, in a long time anyway, I, I, had, I did in the past at some point, but, um, you know, most of it was in the uh, spring. I mean, you know, I, I let them, I put them together and like, I think that year, or last year, I put them together like late December and they all lay clutches in June and July. And I think I might've gotten the last clutch in early August. So, I mean, it's, you know, late spring, early summer. Okay. And it's always consistent, right? Like your females, just like a lot of ball pythons will go the same year they went before and whatnot, or around the same time. Well, the, that one, the one female that didn't go this year out of my six younger females, she, um, she didn't go, well, she didn't go this year, but the last two years that she went, I'm trying to think of what time, when she laid. So I, I have had a lot of green tree pythons hatch in early spring too over the years. Like it, it's weird. Like the over the past few years, when I've generally only been getting about one clutch per year, it seems like I they hatch in. Like I had a clutch hatch in December in 2019, I think it was, and I think it was in February of 20. 21 when I have my next clutch. So I mean, it's kind of all over the board. But this last year, all the clutches hatched in June, July, and August. So I, I don't know. I mean, it, it's just kind of. But now with this new setup with these particular females, it seems to be a fairly consistent. Like it's a you know, like I'm getting my clutches in summer most of the time. So are you doing like a a, a cycling, like a cooling cycle? Are you doing that with ball pythons? And you have a, a just the room, piece? just the room cycling the the room. Um, generally gets a little cooler at night in the winter uh -huh. and gets a little uh warmer in um during the day in the summer and it stays yeah. a bit warmer at night so i'm not really doing anything other than just letting the room do it um i i kind of learned that with my ball pythons years ago I, I stopped messing with the day and nighttime temperatures on the thermostat i just leave them the same all year long now and i just let the the, the very little bit of fluctuation in the room between day and night and between summer and winter. I let that natural fluctuation dictate everything in the room and it's worked out really well for me. I think it's great. I do the same thing here, Garrick. And I, I let, uh, when, you know, temperatures start cooling consistently in the fall here, and it's usually here, it's mid, mid November, but it could be, you know, it could be early December, you know, in some years. And I just, I kind of let the environment dictate when it's time to, Mm -hmm. you know, start cooling things down because I think they can sense it, you know, even inside your room. Yeah. You know, I think they can sense if it's 105 degrees out, even if your room is, you're dropping it down into the seventies, I think they can sense the outside temperature, you know? It seems like it. Yeah. Which doesn't really make sense because how can they sense that? Yeah. You know, but why, I think. Why do they pair when storms come in and the barometric pressure drops and. Oh, for sure. Yeah. You know, 
because yeah, they can sense it. My ball pythons, I mean, yeah, when there's certain days, it's like they're all breeding or none of them are breeding. And the days that it's all breeding, I mean, it's, it's yeah, there's something going on outside. Either a, yeah. a warm front came through or cold front or storm, 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 or storms or something. Yeah. Mine too. In the mood. Yeah. And that's also going back to like doing less is more, right? Because, you know, less adjusting, less fucking with what's going to already happen naturally to your room yeah. due to the weather. Right. I feel like a lot of people don't like they underestimate what the weather outside is already going to do to your room, regardless of you controlling the temperature. They fucking feel they know what the hell's going on outside. Like, mm -hmm. you know, because, yeah, you know, because there's there's a period where like whatever you're heating or cooling, it, it takes time to adjust to get it where you want. So they they know, like, you know what I mean? And and it's also a good thing for them to know, especially when that rain, like the storm fronts that come and whatnot. <laughs> I mean, you, that's stuff you take advantage of right then and there. You know, I, I've seen firsthand. I've gotten things that breed just by pairing things up during times like that with the weather kind of dropping and whatnot. Um, now, I have to ask you, you know, have you always been like a one-on-one guy when it comes to your pairings, Garrick? And what I mean by that, like one male to one female and that's it? Or do you, do you are you pretty good at spreading your male out to a couple of females? You know, the whole Bob Python thing that we do. <laughs> I'm familiar. Uh, <laughs> oh, is he familiar? Shout out to Chuck, by the way. <laughs> no, with the uh, um, with the green trees, I generally try to do one to one. I pretty much just put them together in you know December, and I just leave them, and I don't feed them, I don't do anything until uh, spring, and then I separate them. That's mostly what I do. Um, it's now you don't feed them at all. In the in the winter time, I, I will sometimes. It, it's just it's hard to feed when you got two two snakes in the same cage. <laughs> you guys have had that. <laughs> not, not for more, not for Marshall. It's not. <laughs> well, yeah, you got to really you know prepare for that. But but generally, you know, like I think if I feed my females or and my males really well up through the fall, I wouldn't necessarily have to feed them a whole lot very often anyway during the winter when they're paired up together. I agree. So, um, right. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of what I do. All right. Now, um, now we were talking as far as like you know you having majority crosses more than locality pairings going right because you have Saran going on Aru's and whatnot. Um, but have you ever like invested in like a heavy designer conjo at all? Like, or is this everything in in house what you've been pairing and raising and whatnot? Yeah, I mean, well, I got the ones from Marshall years ago that we did that trade for. Those were designers, blue from a blue line. I, I don't remember specifically what line they were from, but they are, were. Are you, you mean the sterile ones, Garrick? The ones that are <laughs> sterile? Well, the ones that don't just they just don't feel like breeding. I don't know if they're sterile or sterile or not. I never actually seen them locked up, but, but no, they're asex. They're asexual. Asexual. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I had a couple of uh, female designers too from uh, what man I must have gotten was like back in like 2006 or something like that. I actually don't remember if I got those from you, Marshall, or if I got them from somebody else. It was such a long time ago. But um, if you watch uh, Dave Kaufman's first Herpers DVD, uh, I was in that and. I, we we did the interview next to my condor cages, uh, and I, I think I've seen that. Shout out to Dave Ooh. Kaufman; he's coming on the show in two days. Shout oh, out to nice! Kaufman. What do you What do you know? What awesome. a character! I love yeah, that. oh yeah, he's great. I, I love Dave. Um, so anyway, he uh, th they were in that cage, and I, I don't know if you could actually see them in the video or not, but I was like being interviewed like right in front of those cages. But anyway. Um, yeah, those are the only ones other than the the Kapio Island uh, pair that I had. Um, that's those are the only. I know, I know those aren't designers, but they were you know locality. Um, but uh, yeah, otherwise I've never gotten into the designers. I just I just haven't put. I, I don't feel confident about my ability to breed chondros as much as I do with ball pythons. So I've never really wanted to invest like big big bucks in any of them uh, i just know there's so many things that can go wrong with them like uh, you know if i buy a baby ball python from somebody i'm reasonably sure that i can get it to grow up and, and breed fine but man with chondras i mean i've had you know i've had prolapses i've had you know just animals just dying and like you just look at them one day and they're fine look at them the next day they're dead um, you know, yeah, just, that's what makes it interesting. 
<laughs> interesting but expensive. Well, I mean, I remember you know, some of the designers, you know, like going back like, you know, 10, 15 years or more. I mean, I remember seeing uh, uh, an albino at Daytona and that thing had like a hundred thousand dollar price. hundred grand. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you remember that Marshall? Oh yeah. You know what he's talking about? Yep. Yeah. Trooper. Yeah. He had a hundred thousand dollar condor on, on his table. Albino. Yeah, Midas. Yeah, yeah. it's albino. Wow. That was maybe like what was it, like two thousand six or two thousand seven? I went down there like it was. We were set up in that little. We used to set up in that back corner of uh, right. of Daytona. It was like a little separate room, you know, kind yeah. of in the in the back. And it was one of those. Uh, it was one of those years. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Marshall, now, now I know why you keep pairing up the, 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 those head albinos. God. I think, uh, for the now record, he didn't really want to. He didn't really want to sell it, <laughs> so <laughs> he just he yeah. just put a put a price on it. You know. Are those so, animals around anywhere anymore? No, no, they're gone. Well, the only hope we have is Marshall right now with the albinos. That's right. Yeah. Yep. I He's have there. I have uh, heads and heads and possible heads. Okay. And, and and other people like whoever you sold to might possibly have them too, Marshall. Out there, it might be floating. Yeah, around. I mean anybody that has Versace line stuff, all that stuff is fifty percent head at least. Damn. Sixty six. If it's if it's you know some of it's sixty six. No, Garrick, you Garrick, you go back to the Daytona days with Marshall, and I want to ask you guys if you even know or can a answer this question. But what was Trooper like? Like, did any of you guys? Go chop it up with Trooper at the show, or like, like, I, see, yeah. Have an interaction out. What was he like? I'm just curious. I know I got to know him fairly well. Uh, one of my one of my uh, buddies, um, John Romano, uh, worked for Trooper at the zoo, doing Komodo dragon stuff, and uh, we were friends through music, fish, and widespread and snakes. And uh, we, used to, we used to go to shows together. Anyway, he was Trooper's uh, little minion that would, you know, he would go clean all Trooper's house, uh, clean all, all Condros at Trooper's house. Um, he lived with Trooper for a while. Anyway, so I had an in there and, uh, yeah, stayed at his house a couple times, got to see all of his snakes. And he's just super cool dude, man. Uh, wow. Happy Summers has a question. Did he like fish? <laughs> No, probably not. He probably hated fish. Hey, a, 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 a rose from the dead. Shout out to Matthew Summers. Yeah. I don't know, last time we got a fucking chat from Matthew. What? He's here. He's alive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bill, remember him? <laughs> Vaguely. He Ooh. only listened to Sli he only listened to Slipknot. That's it. <laughs> I bet Trooper was more of a death row records guy. Oh man. <laughs> Guaranteed. You seem like a badass. Now, okay, now let's kind of get back to where, Eric, you started kind of selling your chondros. Um, at what point or what year did you kind of feel established where you're able to, let, like, start selling your chondros to other people? I'll let you know in about five years. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, no, I mean, I, I really only – over the past oh, – okay, so when I started finally producing chondros – the price started dipping down because that's about when all the farm raised ones were starting to come in. Okay. So I, I started having to compete with those because especially at that time, a lot of people didn't understand the difference between a true U S captive bred and born and a farm raised. So, you know, farm raised ones you could get for, you know, 300 bucks or something like that. So I ended up having to sell a lot of mine for between three and 400, which I did for several years. Tra and tragic. I know, I know. It was disgusting. <laughs> I mean, but then at, at that point, that's kind of when I, like, I think around 2005, 2006 is probably the last time I had multiple clutches in a year. Um, then after that, it was just kind of like one clutch like every other year or something. And uh, so I, I never really had a whole lot of them to sell over the you know past, you know, 15 years. Um, whenever I, I would, I'd raise them up, you know, I didn't, I never sexed them until they were pretty old. Like I probably didn't sex them until they were like a year and a half old and I would sell any extra males. And then I would keep the females and a male for each female set. I, I did. I figured, well, if I'm not, if I'm not worried about like making sure that, you know, like, like if I don't have like a killer male that I had to breed to multiple females, I would just breed them in pairs. So I wanted to have, and they're not expensive to keep. I mean, 
male green tree python doesn't eat much in a year. So I just figure, well, I'll keep one male for every female that I have, pair that pair one male up with one female every year and do it that way. So I never really worried that much about selling them. If I ever had any extras, um, most of the time I would just sell extra males. Um, so yeah, I haven't really sold. I mean, probably over the past five years, I might have sold four or five. Uh, males only. I don't think I, I can't remember selling a female, but now this year I, I've got a number of hatchlings that I'm growing up and I, I'm not really advertising them right now because I don't, I don't want to have to keep to keep explaining to people like I can't ship them in winter because they're fragile and I live in Wisconsin and they're just, I'm just not going to do it. And I also, I really think that green tree pythons need to be much more established than a ball python or, any, or most snakes. I mean, I'd like to get 15 meals at least into a chondro before I sell it. I mean, I had some that I've had that I've had like even this last year that I had probably like a dozen meals in them, just found them dead on the floor of their cage one day. It's like God, damn. No, no prolapse, no nothing like that. Just I'm eight, not alone. I'm not yeah. alone. Thank that, God. Yeah, this is after like you know 12, 13 meals were the like the first the 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 one that I had that took its first meal out of the clutch and ate every single time since then, just dead. I mean, that happens sometimes, and I don't want that to happen to a customer. So I just figure, well, I'll keep these things in an obscenely long period of time before I sell them. Also, I don't mind if they go through their color change before I sell them too, and, and if I can sex them as well. Is it, bad, is it bad that I like, I kind of want people to get their ass whooped a little bit because I feel like it's like, it, it's going <laughs> to toughen you up. And I feel like it kind of, prepares you what you really are going to more likely face if you want to go there with chondros yeah. i'm talking about for anyone in that just for anyone out there who wants to just jump into this i mm -hmm. feel like okay you want to jump into this you should get your ass whooped a little bit that's all that's all i feel like it's like well oh, like yeah you don't even have to wish that on people it'll just happen <laughs> I mean, yeah. chondros will you know like i feel like i've got like ball pythons or i've got them so dialed in i can do whatever i want i can breed as many as i, I have to keep myself from breeding too many of them Green tree pythons are completely opposite. Like I feel fortunate every time I get a baby to hatch out. And if I can, if it eats right away, it's like, oh my God, I'm so happy, you know, but, and still, <laughs> even at that point, the battle is still not done. Like Imagine, I feel like that thing needs to, I think, I feel like that thing needs to undergo its color change and be like a year and a half old before I feel really good about it. Here, so, getting that the best feeling in the world though, like when you get a baby green tree to eat, yeah is, is there nothing better than that actually like, on the, like the first time the first session that you that you're working with it if it eats it looks like yeah. it's like oh thank god yeah. i got one less to deal with now. <laughs> and move on to the other 14 of them yeah I, i'm literally <laughs> still amazed every time it happens like yeah. every time it, they they take their first meal mm -hmm. i'm like holy shit it ate you know i mean i'm still just amazed by it yeah, and it seems like some clutches are just better than others, too. No like, I've had clutches where most of the babies ate fairly quickly, and then other clutches where just none of them want to eat. And yeah. it's it's so amazing that every clutch can be so different. Every baby can be so different. Listen, Garrick, I want, I want you to understand how much I look up to these two guys, Bill and Marshall, okay? And, and, and I can't remember. I'm pretty sure this was a group text. I can't remember Marshall, but you know damn well what happened. So I was very, I was very excited because my very last, no, my very last clutch before that, my chondro clutch, I would say four out of, or I had like a good ratio where they all ate on the first meal. And I, I let everybody know, I'm like, dude, my chondros ate their first fucking, like they ate. And everyone's like, good job, MJ, congrats. And Marshall was the only one to say, congratulations, prolapse is next. <laughs> and I was like, wow. I, I was like, what a fucked up thing to say. But the, he was, dude, and then literally those snakes all died from prolapses. <laughs> it was terrible. It was so terrible, man. But it's also like, so, like I said, that rude awakening where you don't understand the steps. Like, okay, that's a good thing that it ate, but you're not out of the clear whatsoever. <laughs> um, and I'm curious your relationships to prolapses. Have you experienced a lot of prolapses? Like, like even to this day, are you still seeing prolapses? What do you have to relate to that? Mm, I don't really want to jinx myself. I have not had a prolapse on a baby green tree python in several years, at least. Oh, um, good for you. You know, that's good. None of them this year. I've had some unexplained just mystery deaths this year. Like I think with 
I think I lost three of them after they were already, actually one of them wasn't an established feeder, but the other two were. Um, but I haven't had prolapses in a long time. And um, I don't know, I just, you know, I start them off on small meals and I just kind of gradually move them up to bigger meals. I don't try to push them into bigger meals too quickly. I just let them, I, I've always grown my green tree pythons up really slow. Like people probably think like if, when they see mine at like a year eight year old it's like that that's a year old like it's really small but yeah. I, it works for me and i don't care if it takes six years for them to mature you know i, I just grow them up slow and i mean I'll, I'll a quarter it's the size of a goddamn quarter that's fucking them okay they're literally when they're bored they're they could fit in this goddamn quarter oh for sure yeah 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 so i, I don't know I, I i really you know haven't had a whole lot of prolapse issues with mine and, and do you feel like mainly it was just because you slowed down the meals? You think it's just the way you're raising them up or, or what, is it that, what is it that you feel like? Fixed I, I don't know. I mean, like I said, I, I feed them one small meal a week, especially early on, you know, like now with some of the ones that were hatched in June, I'm getting a little bit more aggressive with the size, but they're still on like a, a, a bigger pinky, almost fuzzy. But I mean, you know, those are, seven months old now almost seven months old um so they're they're getting small meals i mean they're getting a meal that's that's about as maybe not quite as big around as they are and at the at thickest point and they always yeah they're always hungry every time i offer them anything but um you know that's what i've always done with mine and and i haven't really had any prolapse issues um so I, I don't know. I don't know what the why that would be, you know, helping them not collapse. I, I think it's the cocoa husk substrate. <laughs> I think it's the floor. It it gotta be the floor. <laughs> it's gotta, gotta be that floor. It's Maybe be it's a combination floor. of the two. There you go. <laughs> no, I would like to keep mine on on a like paper towel substrate. No, I I, I think it's awesome. Like it's like I, I I've, honestly I've never really thought about it. Um, I've never tried it, but I mean, like, why not? Like, why would you not try it? It keeps humidity better than, way better than paper towels. Um, that's the whole thing. I I think too. Yeah. Like, if I I don't know if my humidity in my room spikes when I spray the floors down, but later, you know, after it, it dries out eventually, and and uh, then it, the humidity goes down. So you know, what's the dry? What's the driest your room gets, Garrett? Humidity wise, I don't even really know. Uh, maximum, I would say probably gets the 60, maybe 65%. Uh, it may get down to 40, somewhere on there. I mean, I'm using cocoa on all of my ball pythons too. So that just the, the sheer number of it in there is contributing to the humidity. Right. So that I'm sure that helps quite a bit too. But, um, yeah, I just I don't I feel like the paper towel. If I use paper towel substrate alone, it would be too dry in their cages. So, Derek, I, Derek, so. we've got a couple of people in the chat tonight that are saying they got their first chondros from you. Yeah, really? Have you seen that? Yeah. So Chuck Amacor uh, and the chondro, the male that he got from you, produced a clutch this last year. Nice. And then, uh, Jackie Lohan mm -hmm. got a chondro from Garrick at Tinley. Yeah, I sold uh, was it four condors at Tinley? It's funny because I brought I brought them to I think three consecutive Tinleys. Didn't sell any at the first two, and the last Tinley I sold all of them. So they're hot. They're hot right now, bro. I'm they're telling hot. you, right now. they're hot. And, you know what? One of the topics we're going to get to. I'll have a bunch of them, a bunch of them in, at Tinley in March. I'll probably That's have. Him. I'll probably I I could probably bring ten of them or more with wow. me. Wow will be really well established so awesome i don't know if i'll bring that many but i'll bring some yeah awesome you should bring them all bro fuck whatever you got available guarantee it shit on the ball pythons i'm telling you it's gonna be great um now um I, I i'm wondering though do you feel like you know it's good that there's so much hype right now behind a chondro as far as people coming from ball python side to the green tree python side do you think a lot of these just sold ball python breeders will figure this out what, what, what do you what you feeling on that garrett 
Well, I mean, green tree pythons are a completely different thing. And just because you can breed a ball python, that does not mean you can breed a green tree python. If, if yeah, it man. did, I'd have a lot more green tree pythons right now because <laughs> I love them and I'd be producing the hell out of them. But they're just not the same. But I do think that it, it's a great side venture to get into. Like people just don't need, I mean, if you love ball pythons and that's the only thing you care about, that's fine. But like for me, I love all reptiles and I love green tree pythons. So I, I, I would never even think about getting rid of my green tree python collection. So I would get rid of my ball pythons before I got rid of my green tree pythons. Hey, hey, Garrick, Garrick, would you say that this statement is true that green tree pythons, although they may be difficult to breed, they're very easy to keep? Oh, for sure. And that's what I tell people all the time because most of the people that want to buy a green tree python from me want it just as a pet display not really getting into breeding and and i always tell people like if you have a good setup if you've got like a nice planted tank and you got good lighting and the right temperature right humidity they are so easy to keep they don't eat much they don't shit a whole lot they're they don't make a mess out of their cages or any of the you know furnishings in their cages and they sit out in the open for you to look at them all the time they're not like yeah. you know you walk by a ball python cage and Oh, that I know my ball pythons in that hide over there in the corner, but you walk past your green tree python cage and it's perched out for you to look at. And so, I mean, you know, and they're, the main thing people have to understand is they're not something you can take on hold on a regular basis. You know, they, they don't like that. They're stressed by it. I would tell people like it's it's more like having an aquarium, but yeah. instead of having fish, you have a green tree python in there. But this thing is going to be one of the lowest maintenance, easiest animals you could ever take care of because like i said they don't eat that much they don't poop that much you don't make a mess out of their cage as long as their their environment does have to be pretty specific but as long as that's taken care of they're a piece of cake and, and but you have to get a really well established one you know like setting somebody up with like a like a new per, new green tree path and keeper with a young baby I would never even think about doing that. That's why I feed mine and raise mine up so long before I sell them. Cause I don't, I don't want the headache with somebody like, Oh, I can't get my hatchling, you know, two month old green tree python to eat. I just, right. I don't want to deal with that at all. I'd rather and, just. And you don't want that to be their first experience. Right. I mean, yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Now um, the biggest thing I've realized too, is just like, man, like let it, let it adjust on its time too. Like it, as soon as you let it just do its thing, it gets comfortable. You will enjoy that thing so much whenever you want taking it out and whatever, because you never really put it in that mindset of it being fucking stress. Like you want, mm -hmm. you want minimal stress episodes with something like this, especially when it first lands into your room. You know what I'm saying? Cause yeah. first, thing, first thing you want to do is get comfortable where it's at, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but it's so crazy, huh? How people, how people automatically assume that chondros will light you up and they're not cool to keep because they're so biting and all that. And that's not the fucking case. Bill just said how he can literally reach into almost any one of his cages, if not all of them, right, Bill? And just touch and do whatever, pull them off, do whatever you want with them, right, Bill? Every single one. Yep. Every single one. Mine are not too aggressive. Um, I can generally go in, change waters, clean poop out of the cage. I did get tagged by one a couple of weeks ago. I got, got a good bite on my hand, but, um, most of the time, you know, if they don't if they don't have any feeling like they're going to be fed at all, I can usually go into the cage, change your waters, clean poop out, or do whatever I need to do. I don't have to worry about getting bitten by them. If, but if they if they smell a rodent in the room, the, they will light me up every single no, time. Yeah, no, no it, doubt. Changes everything for me too. That's like you know, because my BX are they're. They're, my BX are, are the worst. Yeah, my BX aren't like Bills. They're, like, they're nice once you get them out, but they're always ready to eat. They just always want to eat, and uh, it's game time all, all the time in there for them. Um, but I do want to answer this super chat question if you guys are cool with that because we are going to get to this big topic here soon, and I don't want to skip this question because I had this question earlier and I forgot. But shout out to the homie Mike Johnson. Mike, uh, yeah, Mike's a good guy. He definitely got some bills. He, uh, he's one of the Patreon members, and he shared some of your heat earlier in the Patreon uh, yeah. group chat. But anyway, shout out to Mike Johnson. Mike says, can you guys talk a little bit on judging when the right time to move up in mill size and what increments for someone who is keeping neonates as a conjure, as a new chondro keeper? And that's a really good question because you might think, especially if, like, let's just say you have ball pythons. And ball pythons, I mean, you could maybe overjudge a little bit. You could get away with it. It's fine, right? But 
here we are talking about something that is a little bit a little bit more delicate, if not a lot more delicate. So what would you guys have to say to this question? Whoever wants to go first. I, I would say just watch the what look at the animal, you know. Uh if you're if you're feeding it and it's and it's anything more than a hatchling, like a fresh hatchling, and it's leaving no lump at all, in my opinion, that's a little too small. I think that right after you feed them, you should see a small lump uh, that should go away within, you know, a, a couple of days at the most. Um, and I like to keep them uh, on mice as long as you can until they can eat at, at you know, until you, until a jumbo mouse is too small for one meal, uh, keep them on mice versus feeding them, you know, rat pups or rat crawlers. That would be my advice. Marshall, you, when did you switch? When did you switch to mostly mice friendly? Or is this because of the lately? No, I, I, no, I, I feed my adults rats, um, but I feed. I don't switch them to rats until they can. Like it takes more than one jumbo mouse. But you got males that eat rats, so, right? So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. I I couldn't agree with Marshall more, um, and I think I don't like to like push feedings in green trees. Like I'm not a, an aggressive, like, uh, let's feed every five days, but I really try to get them up to something that has some sustenance as quick as possible. So, um, you know, if you just look at their, a lot of times you look at their head, you go, wow, that thing could never eat a peach fuzzy, but yeah, they can, you know, go ahead. And if, if they can't eat it, they'll, they won't eat it. I mean, I've never had one prolapse, you know, and I've had I've dealt with a lot of prolapses. I've never felt fed one a meal, you know, that was after that 15 meal kind of prolapse window that we have that ate a big meal and then prolapsed. So I think it's okay to, you know, push that size a little bit, tr try to get them a meal that has some, you know, sustenance to it, you know, peach fuzzy. Yeah, you know, get them off. Get them off pinks, pinky, like day old pinks as soon yeah. as possible. Get them off pinks as soon as possible. They can eat a bigger meal than you think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I agree with what you guys said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I hope that answered your question, Mike. I think that's really good advice. Now, I'm going to compare some more ball python and chondro type stuff, Garrett, just because, I mean, that's – you and I have similarity similarities to that. We all do. We all have ball pythons. We yeah, ball we, pythons. We, we all do. All of us produce ball pythons every year. All right, cool. So I'm sure you guys all he heard this within pairing chondros where some people just prefer, especially if they're not trying to spread the male around, it's just a one-on-one -on -one thing. Some people pair the male with the female and they just fucking leave that male in there till, you know, I mean, for a long time until, the, until something happens. Um, obviously with ball pythons, the way we do it, if there's no action or if there's no something going on or, and that's happening for a period of time, we call it, we call it a year. We fucking say, fuck it. It's not going down. Right. Um, what do you guys like to do as far as looking at something and feeling like, okay, I'm not seeing any action. I'm going to take him out or whatever. Or, or how do you guys manage breaks for a male? If there's no action, what's your guys is like, you know, thing you like to do when it comes to that, whoever wants to go first. I put my males, I just choose which male I'm going to breed with which female. I put them together and I don't worry about it after that. Like I'm so busy with all the ball pythons and everything else I've got going on. If that pair of chondros breeds this year, great. If they don't, whatever. So at what, that, at what point, Garrett, do you pull them then? What would you say? Like, I mean, if you're, nothing happens and you're like coming by and it's been months, yeah. what do you do? Well, I mean, since I've, I mean, over the past couple of years, I see my condors locking up all the time. So I, I just figured that, well, I'll keep them together and just let them keep locking up until they don't need to anymore. And then, I, you know, so I, I, yeah, I don't really worry about it. So in a sense, people who do that are cohabitating their snakes in a sense. I, I cohabitate mine for a large portion of the year. Wow. Okay. Which makes all it right. really fun to feed them. <laughs> you just gotta sit there the whole time and you you literally can't walk away because i will tell you i got so mr like oh i'm good at this like oh look at me i'm doing two but you know i've i've walked into where the female wrapped her rat <laughs> and then let go and started swallowing the ass end of the male's rat so they were mouth to mouth like this oh, and, it was, yeah. 
And it was a fucking, <laughs> it was a goddamn nightmare. Obviously, the, the female won that battle. The male, I was like, bro, you ain't gonna fuck. You got no chance, buddy. Uh, but yeah, you got you got to sit there and watch that the whole time. If you got the time, do it. But you ain't walking away from that because you're gonna learn real quick. Yeah, you got to definitely keep a close eye on. Yeah. So, Marshall or Bill, what's your what's your male to female like protocol when there's no action? Do you just leave them be and walk away? What do you guys like to do? Uh, I, I'm a separator, and I separate because. Um, Oh, in my experience, almost all the time, if they're going to pair, it's going to be the first 24 hours. I mean, you put that male in, and if both of them are ready, they're going to get to it quick. And if they don't, I separate. I'll wait a week, a month, um, you know, to reintroduce that male. And, and mo most of the time, I am pairing a male with multiple females. So, so um, Bill, so Bill, sometimes you'll just put them to another girl then if that's the case. Yeah, so I'll take the male out, um, maybe rest him a few days or whatever, and then I'll put him in with another female. Um, but, you know, just and, and maybe Marshall can I, – I have a feeling he's going to agree with me that if you put a male in with a female and they're ready, they're going to breed in the first 24 hours. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I did uh, this this year I had uh, a couple of males with well, the two the – two, um, the, the, the pairings that I've got females that are due here pretty soon. Um, the calico male, I took him, took him out and started, i started pairing him and he didn't, he was cruising at night. He was like, you know, showing all the signs that he wanted to breed, but put him with like the first two females and left him in there for three or four days. And he didn't go anywhere near him, like complete opposite side of the cage. And then I put him the third female and they locked up immediately, like within, within an hour. Yeah. Um, and, and same thing with the other pair with Versace this year, you know, I put him in there and he locked up immediately with, with the female, like, you know, the lights go out and he's, you know, making his way over there to her side of the cage. Yeah. Um, so and, and I'm the same way. If I don't see any action in three or four days, I'll pull them apart or separate them, you know, put them back in their other cage or move the male to a different female um, and then uh, try again. And, you know, a, a week later, a month later. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's crazy because even in the monitor game, right, there's people who just leave their fucking monitors together. And if they breed, they breed. But then there's people who believe in like breaking them up and only pairing when there's signs of like ovulation building or whatever the hell's going on, right? So it's it, it's weird because I don't know. It's like it, it, it kind of is like choose whatever you feel is more comfortable with what you're doing. Because well, I, I feel like either way, like Garrett was saying, there's times where fucking that female's doing something and then they breed and that male's been in there the whole time. So but 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 even Garrick will tell you, like in his ball pythons, if you put a male in with a female and a they haven't locked in three days. What do you do? You take them out. Take I, them out. I, yeah, I try to rotate once every couple of days with the ball pythons. Honestly, I probably do things more like you guys do with the green trees too. If I didn't have so many ball pythons, I'm doing all the stuff with. It, it's just it, they're it. they're not like the biggest focus of all my attention. I get it. I just, I get I, I just sure. can't let them be. So yep. yep. But if if I only had like a room full of green tree pythons and and that was like what I did. I would be much more dialed into it, like you oh, guys. Sure. Are. It's hey, I'm not, too I'm hard not, with this. I'm not trying. To, I'm not trying to get all Mister Quote on you or anything like that. But you ever hear that saying? Follow the path that pulls you. Just saying, buddy. Maybe this is a sign right here that you should, <laughs> you, should you should be throwing some more energy into the chondros and maybe less into the ball pythons. I don't. Hey, I don't man, know. I produced four clutches babies this year. I, I threw some energy. Yeah, in. he <laughs> sounds like he's killing it to me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, not even not even trying. Not even <laughs> trying. I know, right? I just put them together and let them do what they do, and and uh, and you spray the floor, and you spray the floor, and I spray the floor exactly. That's, That's the whole key. Everybody damn, needs your carpet damn floor. It's got to be the floor. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, you know, I, I man. So I, I don't know. There's like I said, there's so many. There's no one way of doing it, right, guys? You guys could all admit that. Like you could have your have your uh, your you know your game plan with breeding chondros but i think scenes everything and i and i do think bill's right 
as far as the way I look at it too, because you know, you, you know, goddamn well what's going to happen with the ball pythons within that first couple of days. Like I feel like, you know, and you know, and mainly because I've seen males just want nothing to do with the females. And when I see that in a ball python, I'm like, you're gone. Like, you know, especially after like you have a different female, right? Yeah, away. I'm like, yeah, like you got no business being here right now because typically how it works within 24 hours or that next morning for me, I'm like, oh shit, here we go. They're they're going at it, and that's what I want. That has to be the same with these. It would have to be the same. Like you would think, like right, like timing's everything. And if she has something going on, and that that dude's packing some sperm, it's gonna fucking I should go down. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but what's also a mind fuck is Bill Marshall and even you, Garrick. You guys seen Condros lock, 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 yet nothing happens. Yeah. Well, so that now now usually when that happens with ball pythons, I mean, yeah, you could have a solid breeder, but. You know, females usually that it goes to distance when that usually happens. Yeah. But you know, yeah. chondros it could throw you in the goddamn like you think, all right, this looks great, but she just keeps eating and she never shuts off. And yeah. then she just and then what, you know? So and and you can have the complete opposite, which I find I see very rarely in ball pythons, which is the one and done. I don't see that very often unless you know you use an ultrasound, the one and done. Oh, but I do yeah, it. Green trees, it, it can happen. It, it's happened to me multiple times. It happened to Marshall this year. Uh, I've had. The we'll see. Done. We'll see. Well, I don't have eggs yet. I don't have good eggs yet. Yeah, so don't don't go jinxing ovulation. me. You had a great ovulation, and uh, I, I won't jinx you anymore. But um, I, I, I've had it. I've had the one and done. I've had the none and done. I, I put a damn animal in there for half a day on the stake and 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 took them out because I I put them in there a month earlier than I wanted to. And all of a sudden, she ovulates and has a great clutch. So, you know, it, these things are just crazy. I love them. I love it. I love it, too. There's right. so a lot to be learned yet. Yeah. So wrap-up question time. Guys, if you want to get one ready, um, I'm going to go. Guys, get the likes up, too, by the way. Shout out to everyone who's tapped in. But wrap-up question from MJ is going to be that Garrick 2024 is now upon us. Um Breeding for you means what right now? And what I mean by that, like, are you looking at everything production-wise? And obviously, ball pythons is included in this question. But how how much are you interested in breeding after all these years doing everything that you've been doing? And we're at a point right now where the market's kind of like, you know, questionable. Mm -hmm. What is breeding to you right now at this point? Like, are, are you still as excited as you are, as you were in the 90s and whatnot? Um, and I mean as a whole, not only with chondros and with ball pythons, but all together, what is breeding – Hitting, making you feel like right now i'm so very very enthusiastic about it i mean i it's it's hard like i you know i just recently went through all my parents for my ball pythons went through all my parents to try to figure out what i'm going to breed to who and i'm trying to keep my parents down this year because i don't want to produce more babies than what i'm able to sell and i'm still completely loaded from last year so i'm tr but it's hard because i, I I'm like, okay, I'll breed this male with these females and try to figure all that out. And before I know it, I've got more females slated to be bred than what I want to have clutches. Like if I want to keep it to like 150 clutches, well, I've got like 300 females that I've got signed up to breed <laughs> this year. And I know like two thirds of my females are going to produce. So it's like, okay, well, that's going to be about 200 babies then, or 200 clutches. And I only want 150. So it, it's, I'm trying to keep myself back i'm trying to hold myself down for my natural instinct to breed whatever is able breed every, everything to yeah. so that's so i'm still really enthusiastic like I, there's so many like but, but i think to myself like oh i can make this if i breed these two together well it's just it's just one more clutch one more clutch not a big deal but i i do that over and over again so i'm trying to corral myself and not not do that quite as much because I don't want to produce the numbers that I've been producing just because the sales are not as good. With with chondros, um, you know, I'm going to try to breed all my pairs again and uh, and hope that I, you know, get, I'm, I don't think I'm going to get too many clutches this year because, like I said, most of them produced last year. So um, I'm still going to try to get a, one of those two uh, blues from Marshall to go this year. I'm really, really hoping for that. I want to see some red babies so bad. Me too. Uh, I'm rooting for you, dude. Yeah, me too. So, me three. Me, <laughs> me four. I think I, I think I got those in like 2000 and oh god, I must have been like trying to remember earlier. It had to be like like 2000, maybe three, four, five, somewhere in there. 
I don't Maybe later that. than that. I don't. I don't know. I, look, I, I know I still have that hatch information, but I don't know. But anyway, so I'm. I'm. Yeah, green tree pythons. I know. I. I sense and I know that there's a really a better market for those right now. So if I could get another, you know, two, three, four clutches of green trees this year, I'd be really happy about that. But I, I'm trying to pare back the number of ball pythons that I'm producing just until this lull in the market kind of works itself out one way or another and then you know but I, I still have like a lot of the females i'm only breeding less than half of my total number of females of all pythons this year so i've got a lot of females just sitting on the shelf costing me money i'm feeding them i'm doing everything I'm taking care of them and yep. they're just gonna sit there and wait and i am selling a lot of them the ones that i know that aren't in my long-term plans but like i've got a bunch that i'm gonna keep for another year or two and just if i need them they're there for me and if they're if i don't need them i'll eventually sell them but me too um, Garrick. same same thing yeah. i'm sitting on a lot not breeding a lot just waiting for things to you know settle out i mean i think it's a great strategy other than just running around with your hair on fire you know yeah. and i will yeah. say, before we get to these guys uh uh wrap-up question you said, I don't know how many times, man, what would it be like if you just walked into a room and it was just green tree pythons? Your life would be a little bit easier, wouldn't it? I, well, I don't know if it'd be easier. I mean, uh, you know. If you know. Produce, well, as far as maintenance, many, I'm talking about the amount of maintenance compared to like. Oh, for sure. well, yeah, because I mean, a green tree python, like an adult female green tree python takes up at least four times the amount of space as an adult ball python with the. The cage fighting, you know, at, le at least, like at least, yeah. In my in my second facility, which is about the size of a two car garage, I could probably only keep a couple dozen females in that room. But just think about it, though. What happens if one year you get fifteen clutches? <laughs> so, I mean, you 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 spend twenty hours a week down there pulling your hair out trying to feed the babies. I don't want that for myself. I mean, I do. I, <laughs> Well, I could tell from the wall behind you, but no, uh, I, I just, I, I wouldn't, I would love to have that, like where that's all I had to do maintenance on and take care of. But I, I know that I'd want to try to breed them all. And then when I did, I'd completely regret it with all those babies. It'd just be too much. This, so this, I, I don't this, know. this is the first year that I literally did not pair female green trees because, okay. of, because of that reason. Because I didn't want to have, I knew what it was like this last year to have six clutches, and mm -hmm. I knew that I did not want to have significantly more than that. Yeah, yeah, yep. Mm -hmm. But also, it depends what your technique. When you look at this, right? Like, like for instance, the Ryan Young technique. If it lives, it lives. I'm not stressing over it. And if you have 15 clutches with that kind of technique, well, you're gonna have some good average numbers. I feel you, like. I mean, you, you would have to have that mentality. I, I would think with 15 clutches. You that's know what I'm that. saying. Because you're not gonna get everything 100. percent There's no way you're gonna. You're, yeah, I mean, you it's might, like. You might. If it doesn't eat on the first try, like, <laughs> yeah, just you know, <laughs> done. Say it, Marshall. Say it. Put it. Say I'm it. Not, the, I'm not. No, I'm not say saying it. it. Say I'm it. not saying it. Nope. You freezer friendly fuck. <laughs> say, it, to say it. Oh shit. I don't know what you guys are talking about. Your, your ass is gonna get sued, man. <laughs> Cease and desist. Um, all right, who wants to go next? Go or, uh, Marshall. Wrap up question. Marshall, go. Because I got to think of one. Okay. So uh, let's see. So so you have been at this for quite a while. Uh, you've been uh, uh, pretty successful with with ball pythons. With uh, you've been breeding chondros for many years in a row. You before um, were heavily into gecko, and I don't know what kind of geckos were they. Were they uh, what, kind of, what kind of geckos? Crested. Okay. Everything I've had. So okay. Movies. So I guess like, give me, uh, give us like a hot take on the different communities, like the, 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 what separates the ball Python community from the chondro community. And then how does that compare with the gecko guys? It's really hard for me to say, because back when I was doing a lot of geckos and bearded dragons and chameleons and stuff, that was before all this online stuff. I mean, 
it was that's fair was, yeah you know I, I was never really active in forums because i don't like controversy i don't look for it i don't i don't want to get involved i don't have the time so i was never on any of the forums whether it's ball pythons geckos anything i i never really went on the forums of a whole lot and so i don't i never really got a feel for like the gecko community that well um so other than just buying and selling and interacting with customers and stuff um the ball python community i mean you guys probably know some of what how that can be but again i don't get involved with much of it i mean most of the drama and stuff i hear about it is through this you know mj's podcast and <laughs> <some other laughs> <stuff that's laughs> Wow, Derek! Really, dude? Oh, of course you do. Really? <laughs> you're not it's not necessarily a bad thing. You're very informative, and and I, you know, I I actually get some a lot of good information from listening to you. I yeah, just listen to what? <laughs> Derek. Derek wants real information. That's why he wants. He doesn't want phony. He doesn't want to be fucking fake. I get the it. Line, the line, the line of the night, right there. I love yeah, it. I mean, just listen to one of your podcasts. I think it was your your last one that you did um, just while feeding like a thousand snakes today. I, <laughs> I always listen to your podcast when I'm working and uh, it's a great way to pass the time, but that's how I hear a lot about the different things that are going on in the industry, both good and bad. That's how I hear about a lot of it. So I, you know, like I said, I don't really get involved with a whole lot of stuff online. So I don't have a good feel for the industry uh, for like the, the different controversies and and things that are going on so i don't know if that answers the but question I think, at all, but. I think if there's humans i feel like if there's humans involved there's drama no matter what the fucking demographic oh, sure. is and you know i you know it's it's a that is a respectable like answer because with social media everything's changed now especially within certain communities within the uh, reptile world um you know me talking to gek I, there's a point where i was getting a lot of gecko breeders on the show and mm -hmm. I was finding fucking crazy shit out within the, the gecko community. So there's all this. There's always something, man. And and uh, you just not giving a fuck and not paying attention to it is probably the best thing you could have done for yourself, Garrett. Yeah, yeah. hundred percent. I don't pay attention, but I don't get involved. That's right. that's my main thing. I I don't have time to like go on and argue with people and stuff. I just I can't. I don't. Have to, I work so much at this. Yeah. It's like I don't. I just don't have time for it. So I just try to kind of like. You know, keep on straight and narrow. Just do what I do, and and not worry about the rest of it. And, and try, I try to be friends with everybody, and and uh, talk to everybody. And I, yeah, I just try to stay out of any any issues. Facts. He just comes to trap. All right, uh, what you got, Bill? Um. Okay, so Garrick, uh, you you came into the podcast tonight very passive aggressively. <laughs> <laughs> Wearing that green Packers fucking jacket. Okay. <laughs> so my question to you is, are the Packers going to lose to the 49ers or are they going to lose to Detroit the following week? Ooh. Um, <laughs> well, obviously I want the Packers to beat the 49ers. Realistically, I don't expect that. However, I didn't expect them to beat Dallas last week. I thought there was a chance <laughs> – like a legitimate chance, but I didn't expect it. But it happened quite convincingly. And so <laughs> the Niners, I would say they're pro <laughs> the Packers will probably lose. I'm hoping they win. They'll probably lose. If they get through the 49ers, they're going to the Super Bowl. Damn. All right. Well, although oh, if wow. they don't, okay. I, I'd, be, I'd be thrilled for Detroit and their fans because they haven't won anything in such a long time. They deserve it, man. Detroit they, deserves they it. They do, and, and but so yeah, I, that's how my thinking too. I if the 49ers beat the Packers, I hope that Detroit wins and plays the 49ers and goes to the Super Bowl. That would be the, the Detroit Lions would be my team if the Packers are out. Okay, yeah. Detroit and, and maybe the Buffalo Bills because they I watched them lose four Super Bowls in a row. I watched I watched that too. Yeah, that was four Bills. so I I would be okay with them either. Like Detroit versus Buffalo would be a great Super Bowl for for me, just because I wouldn't. That be would be good. Your team, yeah. But obviously, I want the Packers to go, so we'll see. I don't know. It's a long shot, but we'll see. Well, obviously, I'm just giving you shit, and 
the Packers played incredible. Uh, even as a fan, it was really they, uh, they whooped that ass, dude. Man, they, they did. Even as a Dallas fan, it was really something special to watch them come in. Got a great young team. Jordan uh, Love, man. He's man, he boy. He, he made you know halfway through the season. I'm like, I don't know if he's the guy. But right now, it seems like it. I, I'm pretty optimistic. If we get three, you know, Pro Bowl level quarterbacks in a row, incredible. I was going to say the same thing. You know, you go from Brett Favre to Rodgers, now to this Love kid. Yeah, you know, We've been so I think since I started watching the Packers, I think there's been three seasons that they have not made the playoffs, and that's been since 1990 when Favre. 1991, 1992. Yeah. When they were, not 92, I think it was. But anyway, since then, I think I've seen them not make the playoffs three times ever. So last year was so weird. Like I'm watching the playoffs and I got nobody to root for, which was very relaxing because most of the time, like when you, when we had Rodgers and far before too, but you're expected, like we, we had Super Bowl aspirations every single year. And so there's always a lot of stress every weekend during the playoffs, just stress. And not, like this year, I didn't feel any stress. I'm like, <laughs> I don't expect them to win. So, and they did. And it's like, holy shit. I mean, you know, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's not stressful for us right now. Well, I, I, hope they, I hope they win. And I'm now a Houston Texans fan. Right. Oh, I'm, yeah. Houston. Wow, Houston. Bill, fucking wave your bandwagon fan while you're at it. Dude. I am a, I'm a fair weather fan, bro. You God should know that damn. by now. I'd be okay with Houston, too. They, they, they've had a, a pretty bad time over the past few years and most of the, their existence. So yeah. I, would, I wouldn't mind if they made it there, too. Stroud looks like the real thing, too. So he does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, fuck, man. This uh, two hour episode went by very quick. Garrick, this was an amazing time. Do you feel like you provided some information now? Do you feel better about this episode now, Garrick? After we uh, I had a great time, yeah, yeah, awesome. fantastic. Yeah, I do for sure. Yeah, and, and what's crazy is like I guarantee a lot more people are going to be on on top of your Condros productions now. Hope, you know, knock on wood. Like I said, we don't want you to hit anything that you've hit in the past, but I think you're on the right path, and I'm excited to see what 2024 brings to you. Um, I, I, I hope he has Condros left to bring to the October Ten League. I don't be there in March. I don't think he. I don't think he will. But I hope. I hope you do. I'll be there in October for sure. I'll definitely have some there in March. I should still have some for October too. Hopefully, you sell them all. Hopefully, you sell yeah, them all in I, March. I, I, I was say, I, I'd be surprised if you did. I won't. Yeah, bring, right. I won't bring them all in March. I'll bring the ones that are the most established, and then I'll keep the rest of them for October. All right. So, uh, Garrick, we just had. Just a little over 100 people tapped in on tonight's episode. What do you have to say to everyone who tapped in and just enjoyed tonight's show and everyone who's just happy to hear you talk Conjos? Oh, thanks for coming. I mean, it was a great time. I had a fantastic time talking to all you guys and uh, hope you learned some stuff. I know I definitely learned some stuff. And, uh, yeah, definitely keep in touch and uh, check out my website, royalconstrictordesigns.com. Don't have any condos on there. Don't even have a button for them yet, but hopefully they'll get them on there at some point. Otherwise, <laughs> come, come to Tinley and check out and see what I have. Hey, let me ask you one question. Nice. That you, let me ask you one question that some that's already in your DMs right now. I guarantee it. But do you do wait list? <laughs> Actually, for right now, I am on the condos. Wow, because, nice. You're welcome. Because I can't possibly ship them right now. So if anybody's interested in one, I do a payment plan. You know, I'll ship them out in May or June or whatever. Um, but, you know, contact me and, and I can work something out with you. Sure. And, Garrett, these are a Rue Sarong locality crosses, right? The you yeah. available? Mm -hmm. Great. Epic. Well, awesome. guys, um, Royal Constrictor Design on IG. And also, please go to his website. I'll put all that information in the description below. But, guys, do me a favor. Give it up, give it up for Garrick DeMeyer. It's a wrap, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for having me. Dude, Derek. Yeah, that was a lot of fun, man. Good catch, good uh catching up. Bill Siegel just clapped. That you don't see that. You don't see that. Okay, this is huge. Hey, right? <laughs> hey, hey, hey thank you, hey, Garrett. Enjoy your night. Thank you so much, buddy. Great. Thank you. You too. Garrett. See you, guys. See you, see you Garrett. See Were you guys ready for that Packer jacket? Damn, he came hard with that. He was like he did ready man. to go. You know, hey. what I mean? <laughs> Dude, passive aggressive, man. Just, Super! Like he's trying to—he he, he wanted to get on my nerves right from the get-go. He's trying to get me off my game. 
He tried to BMC you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> he did. It worked. Marshall can't wait. Marshall can't wait. To- <laughs> Marshall can't wait to check his email as soon as this episode's over. He's gonna be like, "God damn it!" Are Marshall my- is now named. Marshall is now named in the suit. I guarantee it. He's now on the list. <laughs> he is now <laughs> named in the suit. Dear Ma- dear Red Mountain Herb LLC. <laughs> uh, no, but guys, what do you think, Garrett? Well, that's action. Hey, what, hey, what, hey, what a great episode, though, right? Garrett was awesome. What. A- what a great guy. You yeah, just, yeah. I mean, yeah. Humble. Such a nice man. guy, man. I, yeah, exactly. Transparent. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And very good at very good at, at all this. Uh, I mean, it's impressive to see somebody be able to do it for a living and not only do it for a living, but I mean, he's been doing it for 20, you know, that's, that's all he's ever done. Like, yeah. that's, that's, all that's ever pretty freaking. That's pretty impressive, man. That that uh, to have that kind of longevity and still be, you know, uh, definitely on t- on top of the game uh, in, in ball python world, you know. And I, I gotta say, I can always tell it brings like a <clears throat> brings like a joy to your to your to your soul, Marshall. Whenever you have someone who could relate to a Daytona story or something that goes back that far, you know, because I don't sure, say, yeah, I don't want to say you're alone, but when it comes to like people showing their face on social media. You're kind of a one of a kind dying breed, buddy. Like a lot of you, a lot of people at your level don't even want to fucking talk to people. You know what I'm saying? Um, but so this is why I think it's awesome that you know you're not alone, really. You got people like Garrick and other people who have stories that attach to you and the Condros all the way back in the early Daytona days. So I, I love hearing that, hearing stories like that personally, you know. Um, so I thought thought tonight was a great episode. And I guarantee more more ball pipe. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. More ball python breeders convert to chondros after this episode, even more after tonight. I guarantee it. 100%. The um, secret's out. See, it's been out, man. It's been out. And I got to say, you guys killed it tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, Bill, let's start with you. What do you have to say to the 100 people who tapped in on tonight's episode? Dude, I'm always, I'm always just super grateful and super humbled that uh, people want to come in here and listen to us idiots talk. So, <laughs> and, you, and, and rumor, rumor has it there's a ye- yellow bills production neonate available right now somewhere is that true there is there yeah. is yeah where where, do, where can someone find that at your your uh web where, where did someone go for that just uh my morph market phoenix reptiles i just posted it a week ago uh yeah got a yellow available uh in fact from the same clutch that your red came from so jaeger clover jaeger clover wow and, uh, yeah this is that this is the first pairing from that pair um, but Jaeger, as you know, has produced in yellows some incredibly high yellow animals. So and Jaeger's already going at it right now. He's 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 in he's paired up with women fucking going to town. What's he doing? This year, yeah, he's he's paired with three females. He's already uh, one of them's done and he's still hitting two others. So God he's, a, he's a beast. Thank you, Marshall. Marshall Jaeger produced by Marshall Mendez. Thank and you. That, and Jaeger came for Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Is Jaeger Versace's son? No. No. Uh no. Okay. No. 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 Totally different. Uh no, no albino chances with uh Jaeger. No. Well, I'm just saying you got you got two males laying pipe for a very long time. It's very impressive. I love it. Yeah. Um, but Marshall, what do you have to say, man? We had hundred people tapped in tonight. What do you have to say to all the support? You know, thanks for tuning in. I had a great time. Enjoyed uh, really enjoyed the guest tonight. Uh so good job, uh MJ setting that up. Totally. Uh yeah. yeah. And thanks. You know, yep. it's always always a good time. I'm really enjoying Tuesday nights. Yeah, me too. Honestly, uh, honestly, when you first uh, hit me up about doing this, I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do this every Tuesday night, but it's been a lot of fun. I look forward to it. You son of a bitch. When I first brought this to you, you were <laughs> you were so stoked. You're like, oh my God, yeah. And you're like, I can't maybe do every Tuesday, but don't act like you're like, MJ, I just don't have time for you. Motherfucker, you were so happy. <laughs> Yeah, don't listen to this ultra male fucking fanatic. What, what else would Marshall be doing on a Tuesday night, right? What? Sleeping, sleep. I can be sleeping right now. You, you prolapse wishing jaded motherfucker. You. I swear. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just kidding. I love you, man. Um, and, and Marshall, real quick, also too, like you know, I'm all rooting for you this year as far as what works out with the Condros. But are you somebody to release information on your Instagram for anyone out there who's on edge, just wondering what goes down? 
are you letting people know on IG before anywhere else? Like, where can people really follow your stuff? Yeah, people? yeah. Instagram's where I post most snake stuff. Uh, okay. Post it first. Both those links in the description below. Phoenix Reptiles, Red Mountain Herbs. Give it up for my two homies. It's a wrap, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Have a good night, guys. Thank you, you two fucking See rocks. you guys. Peace. Later. Later. What an episode. What a group of guys, man. I'm so lucky to be around such amazing uh, people who are in this reptile industry. And I uh, got to say, this was an epic episode. Garrick, you're the man. Appreciate you so much for coming. Uh, you're quite the humble man, I got to tell you, because you do have so much to bring uh, to the entire reptile industry. And, you know, obviously, Condros was the main topic, but you've done a lot, man. Garrick is like a, the real MVP, if you really think about it. So his, like I said, his Garrick DeMeyer, Royal, uh, Royal Design Royal Constrictor Design, sorry. His link to the Instagram's in the description below. So go follow him and make sure you go follow the other homies, Phoenix Reptiles and uh, Red Mountain Herps, okay? But what an episode. Thank you so much, all you Condro lovers and new Condro lovers. Um, if this is your first time hanging out, make sure you hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button first and foremost. And if you hit that notification bell, you'll be on top of all three of my podcasts that for sure I don't miss on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, this Friday, I am going to be doing a podcast with Brian Cusco. It's going to be a tribute podcast to our, our late buddy of ours, Brian Barcheck. Rest in, rest easy. We love you, Brian. But I have something really planned. I have something really awesome planned Friday with Brian Cusco. So I would recommend checking that out, especially if you kind of want some like <sighs> breathing about the situation with Brian. You're going to feel real good if you come hang out Friday. And that's going down at 6 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. All right. And then I'll see you here Thursday night, main, main trap talk going down Thursday night with Dave Kaufman. Dave Kaufman, all right? So thank you again for all the love and support. I'll see you guys here Thursday night. It's a wrap. Appreciate all... Hey, dude, you guys in the live chats, you guys are amazing. You guys are beautiful. And again, shout out to all the sponsors, Gary Shabino. Uh, shout out to um, Texas Condros, my buddy Mark over at Texas Condros. And then, of course, who is the other one? that I My brain is farting right now. Oh, the Reptile Perch. Duh, David Brahms. So... Anyways, guys, it's been a day. I'm going to call it a day. I'm going to call it a night. Have a good night. I'll see you tomorrow. Or I'm sorry, Thursday. It's a wrap.